much for helping us uh, to get uh, Dr. Heb on board. Uh, it's my great honor to join you and uh, it's a privilege uh, to listen to your, your valuable information. And thank you for having me. Thank you. I think, uh, Excuse me, doctors, we are live now. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sai. Uh, so we needed your presence to get the whole thing going. So uh, very good evening to one and all of you for this uh, a very wonderful webinar. And I'm truly on behalf of the I Foundation group of uh, doctors indebted to you all for creating time to be with us. And I'm sure the learning process, which is going to accrue in the next three years is going to be just amazing. And I'm good. these are very niche topics and I'm sure it's going to be of great value addition to one and all of us. We are truly proud to have an absolute galaxy on the expert panel. We have with us Dr. Hemant Murthy, our very own dear Dr. Hemant Murthy, who's a senior mature retina consultant, medical director of the Retina Institute of Karnataka, is an ACE surgeon and a winner of the Reed Buckler's award of multiple times. And he's, we are proud to say that he's been an amazing president of the Karnataka State Ophthalmic Society. We have with us joining soon, uh, Dr. Jatinder Singh, who's a, a, a senior virtual retina consultant, another very amazing skilled surgeon uh, from our Eye Foundation group of hospitals. We have uh, joining us soon, Dr. N.S. Mulidhar, who's first and foremost, our very honorable president of the Vitrio Retina Society of India, and also the president of the Retina Institute of Karnataka, and is one of the senior most retina um, surgeons in Karnataka. We have with us Dr. Ramandeep Singh, who's a senior professor of retina and uvia uh, from PGI Chandigarh. Thank you so much for giving us this time to be with us, doctor. It's good, with great pride, I would like to mention names of our international faculty who are, are on the expert panel. Dr. One is Dr. Professor Riaz, who is again, a very renowned ophthalmologist and professor with over 25 years of experience, is the chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Institute of Ophthalmology at Cairo. We have with us Dr. Mahmoud Leela, who's a senior uh, vitreo retina consultant from the uh, retina uh, department, the Research Institute of Ophthalmology from Giza, Egypt. We have uh, joining us soon Dr. Barbara Parolini. And again, we are truly enlightened to have all the staff faculty with us, a senior vitreo retina consultant and as the director of vitreo retina services from the Institute uh, of Resica, uh, Italy. And uh, it's my pride to have Dr. Ashre uh, as my co-moderator or rather the lead moderator. And uh, he's again, a young vitro retina consultant with so much energy and vitality. And uh, he only uh, cheer picked every single speaker and expert panel and I owe the whole meeting and it's credit to him. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Mrs. Dr. Pridima Deshpande who is a vitreo retina consultant from Evista Eye Hospital, Nagpur. And she's going to set the ball rolling with the topic, role of fundus imaging and clinical examination in pseudo hole, lamellar hole, and macular hole. On to you, Dr. Ridima. Um, uh, Bail you'll have to keep a watch on the time and uh, just give us uh, information one minute before their talk concludes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma sure. And uh, yes, wind it up. Yes, ma'am. To you, Dr. Ridima. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chitra, for the kind words. Uh, I look, I'd like to thank Dr. Chitra for this wonderful opportunity, and I'd like to wish everybody a very happy Pateti. Uh, I'll just share my screen now. I'm going to talk about the role of fundus imaging and clinical examination in suru hole, lamellar hole, and macular hole. So this is the agenda of this presentation. Uh, we all know that macular hole is a full thickness defect at the fovea from the ILM to the RP. It was first reported by NAP, and this uh, term was coined by Ogilvy in the year 1900. Prevalence is 3.3 per thousand population. It's usually unilateral, and women are three times more likely to develop a macular hole as compared to men. 
uh, of all the hypotheses uh, concerned regarding the pathogenesis of macular hole, the uh, theory of androposterior attraction is the most widely accepted one. So in eyes who are predisposed to form a, forming a macular hole have an abnormal vitromacular adhesion, which exerts dynamic traction at the fovea. Along with this, there's contraction of the collagen and avulsion of the mule cell cap. Now, this avulsion of the mule cell cap predisposes to formation of primary full thickness macular holes. Tangential traction, which is exerted by uh, the residual vitreous cortex at the macula after a separation of uh, the vitreous and uh, the con constriction or the contraction of the proliferating glial cells are responsible for the tangential traction and they have a role in enlargement of the full thickness macular hole. Secondary full thickness macular holes are due to causes. Uh, uh, due to other causes, and they are not associated with concomitant VMT. Uh, now, the first biomicroscopic classification was proposed by Donald Gass in the year 1988. Now, it has four stages. Stage 1A is, appears as a central yellow spot. 1B is an occult hole with a yellow ring. Uh, stage 2 appears as an eccentric oval around defect less than 400 microns, which is present well within the edge of the yellow ring. Stage 3 are defects more than 400 microns. They are not associated with PVD and may show uh, pseudo operculum. And stage 4 are full thickness defects more than 400 microns and are associated with complete uh, posterior vitreous detachment, which appears as a wise ring on biomicroscopic uh, classification. The newer classification systems are OCT based. Now, this IVTS classification was proposed in the year 2013. Uh, it has classified macular holes uh, depending on the size, that is the minimum linear diameter, depending on the presence or absence of VMT, and uh, depending on the cause into primary or secondary macular holes. Now, here they've introduced a new stage, that is stage zero, which is vitromacular adhesion, where there is no change in foveal architecture. Stage one is VMT without a macular hole. Stage two are small or medium-sized macular holes with VMT. Stage, four, uh, stage three correspond to large macular holes without a VMT. And uh, stage four of the gases classification corresponds to small, medium, and large holes with a complete PVD and no VMT. Now, the E3 consortium is given a OCT classification, which classifies holes into small, medium, and large holes. Small is less than 250, medium is between 250 and 400, and large holes are more than 400 microns in diameter. Uh, looking at the biomicroscopic findings, now, this is the stage 1A hole where you can see uh, a central yellow spot. There is loss of foveal depression, and you can see fine stri on the retina. Stage 1B, where you can see a yellow ring at the center, and there is loss of foveal depression. There is no PVD, and uh, there is a centrifugal displacement of the foveolar retina and the xanthophyll, which gives rise to a yellow ring. And sometimes you can see this bridging contracted perifoveal vitreous, which can be seen on the temporal edge of this yellow ring. Then these are, this is stage two hole, which appears as a well-rounded defect, which is present inside this yellow ring. Uh, these are stage three macular holes, which are defects more than five, 400 microns and full thickness macular holes associated, large full thickness holes associated with a complete PVD. Now these uh, full thickness holes can be associated with an ERM. They can have a, a cuff of uh, subretinal fluid. They can show these uh, yellow spots at the center of the hole, uh, which, uh, which is presumed glial proliferation. And sometimes they can show this uh, hypopigmented ring under the area of detachment. Most of the stage one, stage two holes have visual acuities of 2060 or better, and they present, they're either asymptomatic or present with mild metamorphopsia. 50% uh, of stage one holes show spontaneous regression and 40% continue to enlarge, whereas 50% of stage two holes show spontaneous closure and 75% uh, continue to enlarge. Now, if you look, uh, most uh, almost 70% of patients with early macular holes show typical pin cushion defects. If you look at the image here, now there is, uh, you know, inward pulling of the facial features towards the point of fixation. Also, the uh, Amsler's grid shows dragging of these lines towards the point, point of fix fixation. These are pin cushion defects, which are seen in patients with early macular holes. Another clinical test is the Vatsky Allen uh, test on slit lamp, where you project a no normal slit beam, a slit beam on the fovea. And patient with a full thickness defect will be able to see a break in this beam of light. Then you have the laser aim, uh, uh, laser beam aiming test, uh, which is which appears to be most sensitive for a full thickness macular hole. Uh, these are the several imaging modalities uh, for a macular hole. You have structural OCT for evaluating the structural uh, characteristics. We'll also look at the several biomarkers that you can see on OCT: fundus micropyramidry, OCT angiography, blue fundus autofluorescence, and adaptive optics. Uh, I think I will skip through these slides. Okay, so coming to the uh, the IVTS classification, 
uh, you can see a VMA that is vitro macular adhesion. So in this OCT image, you can see a broad VMA, which is more than 1500 microns. Then you have a vitro macular traction. Here you, you can see a focal VMT uh, with inner retinal changes and small full thickness macular holes, which are less than 250 microns. You can see an associated PVD. A medium full thickness, uh, full thickness macular hole, which is between 250 to 400 microns. In this image here, you can see a flap which is adherent to the vitreous and large full thickness macular holes. Uh, here you can see a posterior vitreous detachment with a pseudoparculum. There are several parameters to assess a macular hole, and they're important, and they have an important prognostic value as far as functional and surgical outcomes are concerned. So the most criti critical one of these is the min minimum linear diameter, because it has been found that smaller the MLD, better is the visual prognosis and, and surgical outcomes of the patient. Uh, the other indices are the hole forming factor, which is a ratio of the right and left uh, arm lens to the base. It has been found that HFF values of more than 0 0.9 as associated with uh, better outcomes. The macular hole indices or MHI is a ratio of the height to the base of the macular hole. Uh, MHI levels of more than 0. 0.5 is associated with better prognosis. DHI is the diameter hole index, which is a ratio of the MLD to the base. And THI is the tractional hole index, which is uh, a ratio of the hole height to the MLD. A higher THI level and a lower DHI level is uh, a value is associated with better visual outcomes and surgical outcomes after macular hole surgeries. Coming to other biomarkers, what you can see here is the ELM, that is the external limiting membrane, the ellipsoid zone, and the interdigitation zone defects. Now, A and C are preoperative OCTs of uh, patients, and B and C are postoperative patient, uh, postoperative OCTs of patients of macular hole. You can see in the, in the OCT B, there is complete restoration of these three bands after a macular hole surgery, whereas in OCT D, there is associated foveal atrophy. So it has been found that restoration of these bands in the postoperative period is associated with good visual and functional outcomes. Uh, there is currently there is no consensus regarding the role of or the prognostic value of interretinal cystoid spaces, but one study from uh, LVP Hyderabad by Dr. Jay Chablani has shown that presence of these cystoid spaces may be associated with good visual and functional outcomes, provided a good amount of functional retinal tissue is present at the side of the macular hole. Supra RPE hyperreflective granular deposits are indicators of photoreceptor damage. So this is associated with poor visual prognosis. A typical retinal tissue or epiretinal proliferation uh, appears as a medium reflectivity tissue above the ILM. Presence association of FTMH with uh, epiretinal proliferation is associated with worse outcomes. Coming to blue fundus autofluorescence. Now in the multi, uh, uh, this image here, you can see a full thickness macular hole and corresponding OCT also shows a large full thickness macular hole. If you look at the blue fundus autofluorescence here, you can see a classical pattern where uh, you have a central hyper autofluorescence spot that corresponds to the macular hole. This is surrounded by a a hyperreflective, hypoautofluorescent ring. And this is surrounded by a zone of relative uh, um, uh, hypoautofluorescence where you can see these radiating dark stripes. Now, this uh, pattern has been seen in around 70% of patients with full thickness holes. If you look at the corresponding OCTs, now the OCT across the center hyperautofluorescent spot actually corresponds to the full thickness hole. Now, across the hypoautofluorescent ring is uh, shows presence of SRF in the OCT. Whereas if you uh, take uh, an OCT across these uh, striae, you can see that these uh, dark striae are actually the cyst walls and the hyper, uh, relative hyperautofluorescent centers are the cyst area. And if you compare this with the fundus micropermetry, you can see absolute scotoma corresponding to the full thickness macular hole. And then there are areas of reduced sensitivity around it, which corresponds to areas of abnormal autofluorescence. Now, OCT angiography and NFAS OCT are another important uh, imaging modalities for pre- and post-operative uh, evaluation. Now, in an OCT, uh, the deep capillary plexus and the choreocapillaries have uh, shown flow voids and alterations uh, uh, in the flow. And if you see the corresponding NFAS OCTs, you can see these uh, uh, hyperreflective spaces, space which corresponds to the macular hole. You have these uh, rounded spaces, uh, hyperreflective spaces at the level of the, uh, the inner nuclear layer. 
and then you have this surrounded by these radial hyperreflective spaces which giving giving it a stellate appearance now this pattern is also seen in large full thickness macroholes in the post operative period you can see there is improvement of vascular density uh, in the deep capillary plexus as well as the chorio capillary plexus so restoration of the flow in these deep capillary plexus and chorio capillaries has been associated with good functional outcomes after a macular hole surgery coming to adaptive optics now this is used to study the cone mosaic as well as uh, the cone density now the top image uh, this is the confocal image which shows uh, multiple hyperreflective areas uh, uh, which appear as dark areas now these hyperreflective areas uh, correspond to zones of iz disruption that is interdigitation zone disruption in an oct now subsequent images are the post operative images of the patient at several time, time points and you can see that slowly gradually there's an increase in the improvement of the cone mosaic and improvement in the cone density as well so again this is a good prognostic factor this is important fellow eyes of a macular hole now six types of shallow pvds have been identified and it has been found that type 3 and type 5b shallow pvds are observed in uh, eyes with uh, are observed in fellow eyes of a macular hole and not in normal holes now type 3 pvd is a shallow pvd with pinpoint foveal uh, vitreous traction whereas 5b is a shallow pvd with a pseudo -perculum. Type 2, which is uh, a posterior, a shallow posterior vitreous detachment with a smooth perifoveal vitreous attachment. This has been found more commonly in normal eyes. Uh, coming to macular pseudo holes and lamellar holes. I think uh, you're, you have to uh, um, conclude your talk. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just I think, okay. Yeah. Complete it, complete it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, macular pseudo hole appears as reddish round oval punched out defects, 200 to 400 microns in size. They're associated with tortuosity of parafoveal vessels, partly obscured by the semi transparent membrane. There is no marginal zone of retinal elevation or no discrete yellow spots. Uh, the IVTS uh, classification has defined macular pseudo, pseudo holes as having invaginated or heaped foveal edges, concomitant ERM, which is the most char characteristic feature. There's a steep foveal contour, and there is no loss of retinal tissue. Whereas lamellar macular holes are partial thickness foveal defects, which on biomicroscopy appear as reddish lesions, which are as well circumscribed. Prevalence is 1 to 3.6%. Again, the IVTS has given the definition for a lamellar hole as having irregular foveal contour, defect in the inner fovea. There is intraretinal split at the uh, in the retina, which is ha which has a schisis-like appearance, and maintenance of an intact foot receptor layer, which is a way of dis differentiating lamellar holes from full thickness holes. Uh, again, lamellar macular holes can be classified into the tractional or degenerative types. The tractional lamellar hole is associated with the conventional ERM and an intact lipsoid zone, whereas a degenerative lamellar hole is associated with epiretinal proliferation. There's a dis disruption of the lipsoid zone. There's a foveal bump and rounding of the edges of the intraretinal cavities. I'm just going to skip through these slides. So these are basically the four developmental pathways. These are several parameters to measure a lamellar hole and pseudo hole. So it has an inner diameter, a base diameter, a depth. This is a central foveal thickness. And the white arrows are 750 microns on either side of the center where the foveal thickness is measured. It has been found that lamellar holes have a thinner central foveal thickness. They have a wider base diameter and have deeper defects. Perifoveal thickness is similar in both the conditions. It's been found that increase in the size of lamellar hole is associated with drop in the visual acuity and drop in the central foveal thickness, which means that thicker the central foveal thickness, better is the visual acuity. So pseudo holes might have a slightly better visual acuity as compared to lamellar holes. A wide intraretinal split having a bilobate contour is associated with poor visual prognosis and epiretinal proliferation also is associated with poor visual prognosis. Fundus autofluorescence has uh, currently challenged the OCT uh, 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 challenge the OCT diagnosis of these conditions. So if you look at the OCT, you will label it as a pseudo hole. But if you look at the uh, fundus autofluorescence, you can see a hyperautofluorescence spot, which indicates pigment loss. Therefore, it's an in indirect indicator of tissue loss. So you, the, the diagnosis changes to a lamellar macular hole. All these are uh, examples of lamellar hole, and all the fundus autofluorescence image here show presence of hyperautofluorescence at the macular show, indicating tissue loss. Again, uh, the sensitivity in a microperimeter retinal sensitivities are reduced in the area of abnormal autofluorescence. Uh, on an NFAS OCT in a ERM phobius cases, you can see signs of traction. They can see, see these dark 
folds and wrinkling at the level of the uh, the outer nuclear layer you can see a typical radial spoke wheel pattern uh, increased hyperautofluorescence at the macula and on the IR image, you can see wrinkling of the inner retina, which is which can which is more pronounced on the green reflectance image. Can we in to Dr. Ridimam because okay. we are way beyond Hi. eight minutes. Okay, sorry. So just to summarize, uh, normally in a macular hole, hole diameter, ELM, EZ, and IZ defects, uh, supra RP granular deposits, bumpy hole borders, epiretinal proliferation, and Alterations in the deep capillary plexus are usually associated with bad visual and functional outcomes. And uh, improvement of vascular density in the postoperative period on an OCTA and improvement of foveal cone density on uh, adaptive optics is a measure of photoreceptor integrity and have better visual prognosis. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Rima. Uh, that was uh, quite exhaustive. Uh, just uh, one question to quickly move on because uh, Ridhima has covered uh, uh, well, quite a few things on imaging modalities. I just want to talk uh, what uh, to the Dr. Hemant, uh, Dr. Murli there uh, can say. Uh, what are your top uh, uh, three um, uh, macular hole impersonators or can you stop sharing, Dr. Ridhima? Sorry. Macular hole impersonators, I would say, is the, all the pseudo holes or lamellar holes impersonate on a clinical examination, not on OCT. But uh, the other uh, on clinical examination, I would see sometimes even uh, an MACTEL appears like a macular hole on clinical examination. But on OCT, I think you are, you are much more better and you are you're fairly clear on your diagnosis. So, Jatinder, sir. Jatinder, sir, anything you want to add on? Uh, as Dr. Heman said, I don't think uh, on OCT there is much confusion on the types of macular hole. Uh, sometimes a so-called uh, pseudo hole on uh, clinical exam can be a lamellar hole on OCT. So clinical and OCT mismatch can be there. But OCT, if uh, the, the def you follow the definition and the criteria of diagnosis, I, I uh, think that settles the diagnosis. And uh, we can, um, I think, uh, irrespective of whether it is lamellar hole or pseudo hole, the traction and the other features, uh, biomarkers which are mentioned, that would determine the outcome of the surgery. And the indications of the surgery are also settled uh, based on that. So the thickness of the fo fo at the fovea, the integrity of the ellipsoid zone and the uh, interdistrition band, that... Uh, is the, I think the main criteria that we need to look into. I also get an autofluorescence done before uh, any of these surgeries, uh, whether it is macular hole surgery or ERM or pseudo hole uh, uh, with the, any foveal traction, perifoveal traction. That gives me an idea of uh, how much of uh, like chitrogenic trauma is there and uh, whether uh, that correlates with the functional outcome uh, post operative. Um, shall we go on to the next talk, uh, Ashwin? Uh, sure, ma'am. Sure. Uh, see, each of these talks are uh, eight minutes. Vail Murgan, I hope you can hear us. You have to be loud. You have to tell us one minute is left and none of us heard you last time. So you have to be clear. Okay, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. Very obliged because, you know, a lot of content goes through the talks, but a lot of content comes to the discussion. So we'll end up cringing on the discussion. So please help out. And we need to send you all to your dinners too. So we shall now go on to. Uh, a talk by Dr. Niroj uh, Sahu, who's again a vitreo retina consultant from LV Prasad, uh, Vijayawada branch. And he is going to tell us something as relevant uh, newer macular hole indices versus old uh, macular hole indices. On to you, Dr. Niroj. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ashray and Dr. Chitra for this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Ridhima has already yeah. covered um, some of the aspects of uh, indices, but uh, we're going to discuss some of the evidences that are there and we're going to decide uh, whether and they're worth it or not. First, let us uh, come to uh, the MLD. So the classification uh, uh, based on IBTS uh, into small, medium and large, mm -hmm. but the large macro size of 400 microns was based uh, originally uh, but from gases work uh, before the origin of OCT and uh, uh, surgery. So basing uh, this as a cutoff for large macular hole is uh, 
uh, uh, it's not correct in the current scenario although definitely less than 400 microns they have very good uh, visual equity uh, visual prognosis but more than 400 microns where exactly the cutoff lies it's uh, very unclear so this uh, question was addressed by this uh, the uh, manchester large microhole study where they have uh, given a cutoff of around 630 microns and they had a good area under the curve several other studies have also shown a uh, much higher cutoff values of around 500 microns. So this really uh, brings us to the question, is it time to redefine uh, large macular horns? Uh, but uh, nonetheless, MLDs are one of the most uh, consistent uh, and widely accepted factors uh, factor correlating with visual acuity and identifical success. And we often use it uh, in clinics for predicting visual outcomes. Let us come to the uh, preoperative macular hole indices uh, individually and let us review some of the evidences. First, the whole form factor, one of the first uh, uh, indices that uh, uh, came. If you see, look at the evidence, uh, there are multiple studies that have either shown no correlation or good correlation with either with closure or visual equity, thus telling us that this might not be a good uh, uh, in index for uh, prognosis. On the other hand, if you look at the macular hole index, uh, most of the studies actually talk good about it. So we can see the number of studies uh, showing good correlation with either closure or visual equity, thus telling us that MHI could be a good prognostic indicator that can be used in clinics. Uh, again, a DHI or diameter hole index, which is a, uh, just a ratio of uh, inner hole diameter with the maximum basal diameter, this tells us that multiple studies that have shown either absolutely no correlation or good correlation with uh, visual equity or closure, just telling us that again, the pronostic factor or evidence might be slightly low. The THI or tractional hole index, uh, again, the papers are all over the place with no closure or good uh, correlations. Again, this is telling us that may not be a good uh, index for clinics. A slightly newer index, uh, macular hole closure index or MHCI, this actually takes uh, into consideration the curve length. This is not the arm length that was used in whole form factor, but this is the temporal and nasal curve length that was used here. And in this paper, they showed that the area under the curve was much, much higher than all of the rest of the um, uh, macular hole index, uh, indices. So uh, this is telling us that this could be one index that uh, might be consistent uh, with uh, the, the prognosis of the macular hole. Several other studies have shown MHCI to have a very good correlation with final visual equity, but there's a caveat that a few of the studies have taken the arm length instead of curve length and uh, labeled this as uh, MHCI. So again, they should take it uh, with a pinch of salt. The macular hole angle, absolutely no correlation with final visual equity or closure rate. Uh, when we look at the periphobial cirrhosis, Again, the papers are all over the place with papers showing that it is associated with poor closure or poor visual equity. And again, papers are there which have shown that they're uh, related with uh, a higher closure rate and better visual equity. Now, this is just presence or absence of uh, cyst uh, at the whole margins. But when we quantify it, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramesh Venkatesh's paper has uh, quantified it using uh, image J and they have binarized it and uh, analyzed three different indices macular hole area index, macular hole tissue area index, and macular hole cystoid area index. And they've shown that there could be a possible uh, uh, predictive value. As you can see, the area under curve was quite significant and with a significant p-value. But again, when the uh, other papers are there, which have also quantified the area of cyst, but they all have given variable uh, outcomes uh, with respect to uh, uh, the closure rates or the visual uh, acuity uh, benefit. This paper by Dr. Uni's group uh, had shown, uh, had quantified it using uh, actually on OCT, and they have uh, shown that the area with uh, higher cyst area were uh, associated with poor postoperative visual equity. So just to summarize all these indices uh, uh, from only MHI and MCHI, and to some extent, uh, the uh, quantification of the cyst were able to predict the uh, functional and anatomical outcome of macular hole. No uh, presentation will be complete without the uh, presentation on machine learning on AI. This paper nicely showed how they used AI to actually measure the different indices, uh, including the diameters and the uh, angles, and they could. Uh, it was as accurate as manual measurement. 
there are several other deep learning models that have been developed that have uh, been used to, to uh, prognosticate closure rates. I'll not go into detail, uh, but uh, these are some of the examples that have shown a very nice uh, correlation with uh, uh, the closure rates and visual acuity outcomes. Quickly, quickly moving on to the post-operative OCT biomarkers, uh, we already know uh, the types of macular hole closure rates, uh, the U, V, and W type, Q being very uh, nicely associated with uh, good visual outcomes, the type 1, type 2, type 1 closures are very nicely, uh, have uh, very nice visual uh, outcomes, but uh, there is a much more recent uh, classification based on the, the continuity of the retinal layers, either uh, stage 0, 1, or 2. In stage 0, it is open hole. Stage 1, there is some uh, continuation of the retinal uh, fiber, uh, fibers, but there is uh, some gap in uh, uh, some bridging of uh, the retinal tissue in some class uh, subtypes, but in uh, st uh, stage two, there is uh, some, uh, in some uh, subtypes, as you can see in uh, stage two B, there is some continuity, but most of the uh, rest of the area is filled up by glial tissue. As you can see in their uh, table, they have shown that in uh, cases where they've used amniotic membrane implant or autologous retinal implant, the holes closed mostly with uh, uh, stage two type of closure, type two type of closure. So there is much more uh, amount of glial tissue than the other types of uh, uh, surgeries. I'd like also like to uh, highlight uh, much more recent classification that we have described but, uh, recently uh, that is based on on city either it is a linear or a round or a centripetal closure as you can see here in the photographs uh, much more oval orientation of uh, hole at baseline resulted in a linear closure while a round hole resulted in a round type of closure so this is how it uh, uh, looked in uh, pre op and post operatively and we found that eyes with linear closure uh, had much better visual acuity than uh, round closure group in eyes more than 650 microns. But this was not true. There was no uh, difference in eyes which had less than 650 microns whole size. I uh, just would like to conclude with a few of the changes that happen uh, that can be picked up uh, post-operatively also using OCD or on fast OCT. The first is the sample or swelling of arcuate nerve fiber layer. It can be picked up either with autofluorescence or infrared uh, reflectance imaging. It can appear uh, as early as uh, 8 to 10 days post-operatively and gradually disappear in 2 to 3 months. They represent uh, swelling of the RNFL and they have been proposed to be due to surgical trauma due to for, from the forceps or due to damage of the muller cell and plates that result in exoplasmic flow disruption. The downfall initially described by uh, Tadayoni's group in 2001, but it was only described using blue filter photography after ERM removal. It was later on uh, changed, the terminology was changed to C CMDS or concentric uh, macular dark spots because these were uh, these were not actually uh, dissociation but they were actually cleavage uh, uh, lines and they extended beyond the RNFL into the GCL or IPL as you can see from this uh, OCT and on pass OCT images. Uh, they appear uh, between two to six months but they do not decrease or resolve, or resolve even with uh, long-term follow-up. A uh, few other changes include temporal macular thinning, retinal nerve fiber thinning, or G3 complex thinning. Uh, these are some of the uh, uh, indices that can be used preoperatively or postoperatively. It's up to us to decide which to use in clinics. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Neroj. You managed to make a very dairy topic very interesting and crisp. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Neroj, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, uh, like, uh, if I have to ask you, you know, like, which is the, uh, apart from MLD, uh, if you want to use one, you constantly use one uh, indicator in your daily to day practice, what would be that? I usually uh, use sometimes use uh, MHI, as I said, uh, the evidence is quite good. And if you look at it uh, on the perspective of a drawbridge, so if you consider a drawbridge, uh, uh, of, of which has a big uh, base, and if the height is more, it will tend to uh, oppose each other with each other much better than uh, those who have a smaller height. So MHI, both uh, uh, in terms of evidence and in terms of if you apply some logic, uh, it gives us better idea whether the hole will close postoperatively or not. So I would like to use MHI. Uh, uh, Ramandeep sir, uh, sir uh, do you uh, think uh, uh, like all other uh, uh, kind of entities have multimodal imaging? 
so we in macular hole uh, it's only oct based so do you think uh, uh, 3d structure we are uh, trying to interpret in a 2d structure do you think there is a need for a uh, uh, composite uh, um, indices uh, involving all the uh, multimodal imaging or whatever we have are good enough for, to predict uh, uh, the visual outcome and functional uh, anatomical outcome yeah so uh, I, I think what dr jatinder has already said i i totally believe in that actually so if we have i have to really go for uh, indices my indices remain you know uh, the, uh, the 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 kind of a size of the hole and the, uh, how symptomatic the patient is and the autofluorescence works works a lot so i don't want in a multimodal imaging anything else just an oct and autofluorescence are good enough to uh, 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 tell the patient prognosis and they work most of the times in these patients actually yeah. so you are saying uh, oct and autofluorescence will will you win the game in a macular hole surgery absolutely. both preoperatively and post operatively Abs absolutely absolutely yeah great sir thank you uh, we shall go on to our next speaker, Mr. Vail Murugan. You have to loudly say one minute left. We are not able to hear you. Huh? Yes. No. There's something wrong with your mic, so please ensure. Okay, we'll check it. Yeah. We have our next speaker, Dr. Amandeep Singh, and he's going to be talking to us on role of different dyes and IOCT in macular hole surgeries. So on to you, Doctor. Yeah. So I'm I'm sharing my screen now. Yes, sir. Just a sec. Yes, sir. I can hear you, Vedo. Yeah, can you see the screen? Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll start now. I, I, I thank the organizers for having me and making me part of uh, this webinar on intricacies of uh, macular hole surgery. Uh, coming to the straight to my topic given to me, uh, uh, as the previous speakers have shown, uh, told us that there is a definite role of the tangential traction in the causing the macular hole. So ILM has also been indicted as a culprit uh, among these tangential tractions. And uh, the studies have shown that its removal leads to the increase in the anatomical success, and thus further it leads to the uh, eventually the functional success also increases in these eyes. Uh, you must have, uh, you know, the ILM being a transparent structures. Uh, we have seen our, uh, 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 we have uh, ourselves, our teach, uh, we have seen our teachers trying to remove it. Uh, uh, without using dyes, but it eventually causes more damage when you, you are trying it uh, to peel it without a, a dye there, actually. And the whiter dyes are used to make this thing visible so that it can be removed without causing a damage to the uh, other, uh, the nearby retinal uh, tissue, which is the RNFL is the most important there. Uh, further, the dyes also stain this uh, hyaloid, posterior hyaloid and ERM, thus uh, helps in ensuring its, its removal also. As my previous speaker has shown that the ILM peeling per se also causes the damage to the tissues actually. And uh, this is what we have to remember also. When you're talking of a dye, you are looking for a, a ideal solution which does not affect the wider tissues adjacent to the ILM. As I've already said, the retinal nerve fiber layers and, 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 and it should not affect the exposed photoreceptors which are you know, exposed in the area of the macular hole where there is no, um, the, uh, no retinal uh, tissue there. So it sh let alone it should be mixable, it should be easily removable. And uh, you know, uh, it, it, it has to be, you know, blue and green is a good color because it gives a good contrast against the uh, orange red color hue of the, uh, of the eye. And it should not be costly there. So these dyes have been shown to cause uh, visual field defects in the in, in the in the long post op periods and it can also lead to suboptimal visual gains this can be sh this has been shown in the clinical studies and apart from that the experimental studies have shown lots of uh, problems uh, due to dyes this is what we have to remember when you're looking for a, a ideal vital dye uh, for 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 staging the ilm 
so this is the table which i which i i i made actually myself to just to summarize what all is happening and what all is has happened in the past so uh, this the indocyanin green was uh, you know most was most commonly used and still being used in the some part of the world and the various concentration people have used that uh, indocyanin green experimentally if it is more than point uh, 05 mg per ml it is toxic uh, to the eye the people have tried uh, to make a balance of toxicity and the ideal staining they want so this uh, this this uh, this you can see that this has been done and the other problem with the icg dye is it has to be used under the air and uh, you know uh, then uh, you know uh, people uh, you know moved uh, the uh, the work on the tripan blue see this is not a tripan blue which is used for the uh, anterior capsule staining so you have to take care that that is 0.06 percent but this is 0.15 percent we are using and it takes care of only erm and pvr so it, it was not worth using it for uh, the, uh, the the ilm staining and then there was a in the market there was a, a a kind of a dye where they combined the tripan blue and the and the BBG and polyethylene glycol to just to so that it can be used under the liquid. The issue is people don't want to let the dye spread into the whole eye so that it can damage to the uh, do damage to the, all the tissues. So you want something which is concentrated in the posterior pole. So this this has been uh, used, but again the cost is, is there. And then the commercially available uh, uh, BBG with only PEG is there, where which is ideal for a macular hole. And again. Uh, it, it is to be used for 60 to uh, 120 uh, second in fluid and then you know because of the non availability of this peg there in, uh, in 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 the commercially available dyes in india the people have dried uh, used a uh, cold bbg with hartman solution so that it sinks there in the posterior pole and then people have used uh, uh, this uh, the distilled water there i'm very fond of this work by dr dhananjay shukla and his team while he was in urban so they have used this. Uh, we, we use it this uh, dye uh, nowadays in this concentration. Yeah. So this yeah. is like BBG in a in, in a ten plus percent dextrose uh, solution. Uh, they propose that use it two to one ratio, and ultimately the commercially available dye is 0.05 percent. And then if you if you if you mix it in the two to one concentration, it takes care of the uh, you know the concentration becomes 0.33 percent and use it for 60 to 120 uh, seconds there in fluid. But what is important here is you have to use only 0.1 ml or 0.15 ml of dye. Do not inject like, uh, uh, because the dye is going to settle in the plane you want at least. So do not over inject. So the uh, if you inject more dye, if you leave it in the retina for more time, if you let your endolite inside the eye during that time, it, it will cause more damage. So these are the things you have to take care of that don't uh, uh, check, check the concentration, uh, check the time, keep the, you know, the, the sclerotomies plugged there and the bottle height down or the, uh, uh, so that uh, there is no uh, side effects of the dye and take it out within 60 to 120 seconds. You will know your uh, uh, kind of a thing that what kind of a uh, color you want to work with. And this is just a video to show that how uh, nicely this a, a, a viscous kind of a thing is uh, there. Th this this solution is, and how it nicely spreads. And once uh, once you take it out, and gives you a, a, a nice stain there. And this works very well in our hands. I'm using for we are using for the not not, not last more than uh, five years there. So my next topic was the the intraoperative OCT. What is the use of intraoperative OCT? Was macular hole surgery. So we this this machine is there with us for now now more than half a decade. So you can see how I can get a view while I'm doing operating with the uh, with the uh, with uh, with the microscope eyepiece and on the ingenuities. In both ways, I can use uh, IOCT. IOCT has been shown that it it increases the decision making or it improves the decision making by. 30% in all the macular hole surgeries. You have to remember that what, what about in macular hole surgery? How does it help us? So when uh, the macular hole surgery uh, started, we've been staining everything and we were running, uh, OC, sorry, we were operating uh, under IOCT with everything. But for uh, things like ERM, because we know that the IOCT has a kind of a resolution, it picks the ERM very nicely. And while I'm doing a uh, vitrectomy and peeling of the ERM, I can see that it has been peel, peeled off nicely. But this is not the same with the ILM. 
present days OCT does not have resolution with which I can pick an ILM with the naked eye. I wish we have that kind of a IOCT one day with which the ILM need not be stained and it, it can be removed using IOCT or some other technique. So dyes uh, uh, use can be negated. You can see that how it has been done. So uh, we were using in uh, like in every case of a macular hole just to show that how it happens. We were using in case of uh, uh, the uh, uh, the neurosensory graft and so that uh, it, the, how the graft is nicely uh, play, uh, placed in the interoperative OCT. But one would argue, and I definitely agree with them, uh, there is no definite use of IOCT in this. This can be done with the naked eye. That's okay. But where the role is, is in this condition. This is the pathological myopia with macular hole. No way with the staining you can say exactly where your ILM, you have placed it over the macular hole or not. So this is, you can see that how after the peeling, uh, the ILM is being filled by, uh, is filling the macular hole, be it a multi-layered -fla flap or a single flap. And so this is the, the important thing. And this video, you can see, this was the case with the, with the macular hole with the surrounding detachment. You can see, I can see the, uh, the ILM there after staining, but only the IOCT will tell me whether I have put it on the right place or not. Yeah, I'm finishing. Yeah. Yeah. So this case has done well. So present day, the role of IOCT in macular hole surgery in my armamentarium is just for the eyes, where eyes of myopia, where it is difficult to see the macular hole, not all the myopic macular hole, but one with the large you know, uh, eyes uh, where I'm not able to see clearly. I run IOCT in all these cases, especially in the pathological myopia, not uh, rest of the cases. I, I thank you so much for your uh, patient having. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramandi. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, uh, extremely good surgeries. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, the excellent presentation. I had a good doubt, sir. Uh, yeah. When we are using these instruments, there is a back shadowing. Uh, yeah. Does it really uh, interfere with the surgery or uh, uh, is there uh, anything uh, uh, like uh, you are seeing the live feedback? So this back shadowing and uh, uh, the lag time, uh, is there any problem uh, dealing with this? See, the, uh, the, your last question, there is no issue with the lag time. Now the recent machines does not have any lag time. You know, this lag time is, uh, you know, for the posterior segment surgeon is not there. It was bothering the fast, you know, FACO surgeons, the anterior segment surgeon. For that also, lag time has been taken care of. For the shadows, you can only pray to the God that they bring in more instruments which are, which don't, uh, 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 which do not uh, have shadow there. So we have to wait for the technology to come. Uh, there was a third question also. What was the third question? Uh, the, only this question uh, about yeah. the back. So back shadow, you can only, only pray. But yes, the back shadow initially does cause problem, but once you gain experience on the machine, I mean, it doesn't bother you at all. Yeah, it doesn't bother you. Sir, uh, uh, Jasinda, sir, uh, I guess you were also on, on Dr. Shukla's team on that uh, work. Uh, yes. is, uh, does it, uh, uh, staining under air, does it alter any toxicity or uh, uh, it gives you a better staining? So does it uh, uh, make any change? I think with the DNS, uh, you don't need air for that, actually. So I think that is what is uh, BBG with DNS is taking care. You, it, it decreases your time, actually. So uh, I think uh, the uh, if it if something can be done under the uh, uh, liquid, it's better. But yes, for the ICG and other dyes, yes, the under air is always preferable, but not for BBG. I think air came into use only for trepan blue, which had a very poor staining. For BBG and heavy BBG using dextrose, uh, there is uh, hardly a need because all the dye falls on the posterior pole. Absolutely. And you need to use very uh, less amount of volume of dye used is minimum. Thank you. Thank you very much. We shall go on to our next speaker, Dr. David Shah, who is a uh, uh, joint medical director of Choitram Netralia at Indore. And he is going to be talking to us on when and how to peel the ILM in lamellar macular hole. On to you, doctor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's very, very sweet of uh, Dr. Chitra, madam, and uh, Dr. Jatinder to invite me to share my presentation. Rather that, I would say share my movie. So let's let's go through the movie called Lamellar Macular Hole, right? So 
whenever we see cases of lamellar macular holes or whenever we see OCTs like these coming in our OPDs, we are very happy because we say, hey, that's a lamellar macular hole. Nothing is going to happen to that. So how did we say it's a lamellar macular hole? So there are certain characteristics. So there is a break at the level of inner retina with some splitting or schisis. There is absence of a full thickness defect and they slowly progress over a period of time. So do we observe or do we operate these cases? So to understand this, we need to understand the classification of lamellar macular holes. So lamellar macular holes are basically classified into two categories. The good one, that is the first one, is a tractional lamellar macular hole, which has a thick ERM, intraretinal schisis, and more importantly, if you see the outer retina, the outer retina is absolutely clean and intact. So these are our friendly lamellar macular holes. That is how I call them, because these are good holes to have, because they don't progress. In comparison to that, there is a degenerative lamellar macular hole. So how do we understand? So if we very closely look at the epiretinal membrane that is present in the degenerative macular hole, it is very thin as compared to the tractional macular hole. And if you see carefully, you can see some hyperreflective dots accumulated below the ERM. So these are postulated to be trapped mular cells or trapped vitreous. And this sign in a lamellar macular hole is called LHEP or lamellar hole associated epiretinal proliferation. So this is a poor prognostic marker. Now going to the shytic area, that is the intraretinal architecture, you see there is not much schisis in these cases. And whenever we have minimal schisis in these cases, we have observed that the outer retina is really bad. The photoreceptors have nearly gone and the RP is damaged. So this is like a representative picture where you can see the lamellar hole associated epiretinal proliferation, minimal schisis, and the outer retina is completely damaged. So these are our enemies. These are poor prognostic holes and operating such cases can cause actual de-roofing and leading to a full thickness macular hole. So that is what I tend to call them. Again, to diagnose, as Dr. Japinder mentioned, I also tend to use a lot of autofluorescence in my, in, my, in my macular hole cases. So we know normal autofluorescence is because of lipofusion that is accumulated in the RP. So when we see tractional lamellar holes, the outer retina and the RP are absolutely intact. So that is the reason the fluorescence is near normal. But when we see degenerative lamellar holes, the outer retina is gone and so is the RP. So you might see an abnormal autofluorescence like we see in this case. There's a hyperreflectivity or a hyper autofluorescence. So now we know that there are two kinds of holes. One is tractional and one is degenerative. And degenerative are not to be operated. So now we come. Do we operate all tractional lamellar holes or do we observe them? So what is the strategy which I use in my OPD? So I have certain criteria when it comes to lamellar macular holes. So the foremost criteria is I never tend to advise surgery on the first visit. I would rather want to see the patient again and again for the next three to six okay. months. And I would want to see two factors. One is metamorphopsia worsening over a period of time. And second is a drop in vision. If I see these factors increasing over a period of time, then I think of a surgical plan. And very importantly, we tend to neglect cataracts or certain small defects in these cases. Removing a cataract might lead the patient to 6-6 and 6 again. So let's see some of the cases that I have seen in my OPD. So there was this 46-year-old engineer from UAE. He had come for a routine checkup. And he was absolutely okay. He was 6-9 and 6, no problem with his vision, no problem with his work. But on the OCT, I saw a very fine ERM, a small dip at the level of fovea. But the outer retina is intact. So I said, okay, let's observe, but let's see you after six months. To my surprise, after six months, he had some area of schisis, but now also you see the outer retina is still intact and the patient is not complaining. So again, I asked him to see me back after three to four months and he came after six months. Again, the schisis has increased a little, but more importantly, he is absolutely symptomatically free. He does not have any symptom at all. And the outer retina is intact. The ERM is the same. So again, I advised an observation and to my surprise, after seven, eight months, when he came back, there was a formation of an early lamellar macular hole. But here also the outer retina is intact and the patient is still not complaining. So would you really want to advise a surgery? The hole is progressing. The patient is six, nine and six, and he's not complaining at all. 
So I personally don't tend to operate these cases, but I keep them under close follow-up and I tell the patient that it is very important to keep on observing such things because if it worsens over a period of time, you might need a surgery for the same. So this is again one case, a representative case where the PVD induction was actually seen over a period of six month interval. And now you can see nice lamellar macular hole with intraretinal schizis. Patient is still 6676 with this picture. So at two years, he came with a cataract when he, he was 612. There was an early cataract and it's 12. He removed the cataract, PVD got induced and now he's stable at 6676 again. So these cases don't need to be operated. In contrast to that, there was this very rigid type A 52 year old male banker and he had severe metamorphopsia. This time he was consulting with me for the third time. And the same complaints. Sir, it is metamorphosis. I have metamorphopsia. I have vision loss. So when I saw his picture on the third visit, there was an epirectinal membrane. There was a lamellar macular hole. And the outer retina was absolutely intact. So things were in good favor. And the patient was extremely keen for surgery because he understood the risks and benefits of the surgery. And the patient was absolutely ready to take the risk. So since he was extremely persistent, I advised him a vitrectomy with a peel, uh, with a tamponade, of course. So I went ahead with the surgery and I did not want to do extreme maneuvers in these cases. So I used a little triamcinolone and I started inducing the PVD, which I feel is the most important thing in these cases. Inducing a good PVD is extremely important. So you can see the hyaluronic getting beautifully lifted up. So now the PVD was induced. I raised a small flap of the hole and I just peeled around the area of lamellar macular hole. What I did differently is I did not try to do all the fancy techniques, nor I tried to peel extensively. I did not try to do an arcade to arcade peel. I just removed the ILM and the ERM over the surface and put a good tampon ad. To my fortunate surprise, he was absolutely symptom free after one month. Not that his vision had improved much, but the metamorphopsia component had gone and the foveal contour was restored. So what I feel is lamellar macular hole for a retina surgeon is a very tricky situation where you want to operate. One minute left, doctor. So where you want to operate these cases only when the patient is extremely willing for it, or there is extreme metamorphopsia or consequent vision loss on subsequent visits. So at the end of the day, in a nutshell, I would want to say whenever you have a case of lamellar macular hole. It's very important to talk to the patient, understand his needs, understand his psychology, and then only advise surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. David. For a non-retina person, each of these talks have been amazing. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, ma'am. Thank you. David, uh, that, uh, you said a movie. It was a great storytelling. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank um, you so much, sir. Uh, uh, sir uh, uh, Mulidhar, sir, I had a question. So, uh, like you might have started from uh, um, Kelly and Wendell uh, uh, talking about macular hole and so many Michael Eska talking about tile and peeling. Now we are talking about lamellar macular hole. So uh, do you take this metamorphopsia so seriously or uh, are your indications changed over the years or it's still the same? Uh, because it's a tricky situation as Dr. Uh, uh, Devat mentioned. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I enjoyed the talk, Dhaivat. It was a very nice Thank talk. You, Thank you. And uh, I actually agree with what all you said. I don't generally tend to touch lamellar macular holes unless the patient is really symptomatic with metamorphopsia. And even if there is metamorphopsia, unless it is disabling, I might not right. operate. If the patient is able to tolerate it, if the patient has good vision, 6-9, N6, I tend to observe them. I am very conservative. Okay. I don't think my indications have changed much over the years as far as lamellar macular hole is concerned. I am very conservative and I operate only when there is documented drop in vision and patient is having metamorphopsia and wants to, you know, wants something to be done about it. I can't agree more, sir. Absolutely. Uh, Sarvanan, sir, uh, do you think... Uh, 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 you are happy with doing what David did and peel it over the macula or would you have any reasons for foveal sparing ILM peel in this kind of case? You are muted, uh, Sarunan, you are muted. 
So I also uh, peel across the macula. I don't do a foveal sparing my uh, peeling. But uh, to rightly uh, put it in perspective is that uh, I am also not very uh, uh, keen on operating on uh, lamellar macular holes because the patient usually does not have much of a visual improvement following surgery. Even though the OCT may look a little bit better, the patient's uh, experience itself is not that very rewarding. So I usually uh, try to hold off till the patient is very, very symptomatic or very insistent. I, I am a little bit laid back as regards to uh, LMH is concerned. Sir, since we uh, uh, are not uh, standard, as a standard practice, we don't measure metamorphopsia with M charts as they are doing it. Would that add a perspective about the newer indications for managing, because patient is complaining of metamorphopsia, we tell them to suffer. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. And keep telling him, is it fair? Is it uh, ethical uh, to may make them suffer? Or is it uh, important to measure it? Probably, but right now we are not doing that. Probably it will be uh, prudent to measure and so make a documentation of it. But in the same complaints in a routine apparatal membrane, tractional membrane, I, I am very uh, keen to operate immediately. But my only reservation is for a LHEP, lamellar hole epithelial apparatal prolip. In that case, I am a little bit hesitant. But for routine tractional mm -hmm. ARMs, I am very, very uh, aggressive. I operate even with the, even if the patient has got 6-6 six, six vision. If they complain of uh, uh, distortion, I immediately take it up for surgery. Actually, no, can I can ask uh, something yeah, yeah. Please go for Saravanan sir, like for example, of course, if there is an uh, LHEP, as you rightly mentioned, it's a, a tricky situation. Sometimes if you're operating for a TRD and you have ERM, you're not planning to put an oil where you want to take off the ILM. There, if you inquire this LHEP tissue, what's the end point of peeling? Like, will you just peel it in what, leave it or trim it? So I peel it. Uh, so once you start going into the LHEP, you'll see the yellow color is xanthophyll discoloration. Yes. So I just, just like fovea. Uh, sort of stop there. I trim it till that age and then sort of uh, uh, pull it over the fovea to sort of bridge the gap. So my xanthophyll, okay. visible xanthophyll pigmentation is uh, where I, I mean, slightly uh, peripheral to that, I trim it off. Uh, exactly. Like primary LHEP, you don't operate, but intraoperative when you encounter it becomes tricky. So okay. thank you, sir. I have a question for Dr. Devat. And yes, the panelists, yes, yes, yes. So the first uh, case that you showed, when you mm. showed the serial OCT, is that the lamellar hole eventually converted to a more degenerative type. So initially, it, it was a very yeah. sharp split, and then later on, it True. became more degenerative. True. Although the visual acuity was okay, even at that level, mm. but could we have done anything earlier? Or does early surgery or early intervention in these patients help? Or they are eventually going to progress to degenerative anyways, and we leave it alone? So I feel in these type of cases, uh, the surgeon is on a seesaw, right? The patient does not have vision loss. The patient is absolutely symptomatically free. And uh, the patient understands. And these patient, this patient was very vigilant. He was using an Amsler. Plus he was coming on routine follow-ups. He was taking a follow-up at three months in UAE and six months in India. So I personally don't tend to operate these cases on an early basis. But I tell them on the first visit itself, if this thing tends to progress, you might need surgery mainly to reduce your metamorphopsia and to maintain whatever vision you have. So that is how I manage these cases. I am a little conservative. I'm not very aggressive. Yeah, I so think that's, a, that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I yeah. think that's a very good yeah, point. Yeah. You should look at patient symptoms to Exactly. Discuss. Yeah, exactly. So than than not treating the OCT. Rather not treating the OCT. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a little chair time in the OPD, I feel can make that difference. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ashraya, we, if you have time for a just a single question, uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Maybe the panels. May, may, I, I was quite interested to see that uh, Daivat mentioned the use of SF6 in the patient he operated. Mm -hmm. See, in my own practice, I generally tend to use only air when I'm operating on a lamellar macular hole or an ERM. I I, do, I never use a, a gas, even SF6 or C3F8. So I'm just interested to know what the others, other panelists do, you know, in their practice when there is an ERM, no macular hole, no pultus macular hole, and uh, uh, or even a lamellar macular hole, no full thickness macular hole. What would they use? I would just use air. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, Leela Mohammed. Yeah, I would use air in, in lamellar holes. Absolutely. 
just an extension we, of this question that can we close the rm under fluid only i mean that's another spectrum of this question i don't usually use any uh, tamponade either air or gas even air air do you want to use air no, no air no gas yeah that is what that is was an extension of the so question correct correct yeah dr heb you want to would like to have know your comments if you are here well for uh, for no tear no air so uh, if there is nothing underneath that it doesn't make sense putting any tamponade if it's just a uh, lamella i don't think that air adds anything it makes us feel better but theoretically you don't um, there is no communication between the subretinal space or you don't do laser or whatever so theoretically you don't need air even very true thank you so we shall now go on to dr ashe talking on indications for conventional inverted ilm and free flap techniques so on to you ashe thank you hope my slides are visible yes yes visible so uh, uh, good evening one and all uh, i would be uh, talking on indications for conventional inverted ilm peeling and free flap techniques in macular hole surgery so have no uh, uh, financial disclosures and uh, as ridima has already uh, um, uh, uh, discussed in uh, depth about the classification system where the newer system have added the vitromacular addition and uh, vitromacular traction uh, to the full thickness macular hole. The earlier IBTS uh, did uh, uh, um, um, give the classification to small, medium and large, but the large, which is uh, uh, quite a, a bit of our uh, of our macular holes are uh, more than 400 microns. The newer close study group gave further uh, classified into large, extra large, uh, uh, extra, extra large and giant uh, um, uh, macular holes. So uh, as we all know that parcel and vitrectomy with uh, vitreal dye assisted ILM peeling is very safe and reliable procedure which induces the closure of macular holes in up to 98% of the cases. But challenging cases like large macular holes and uh, macular holes associated with time of are usually associated with poorer outcomes. And hence, uh, uh, in 2010, Dr. Michael Evska et al. published their very famous inverted ILM. And, uh, and then we had, uh, uh, in 2014, the free flap techniques, which are uh, uh, most resorted as primary techniques in these macular holes. So uh, on consensus on, uh, on the literature, whatever we have till today, uh, the most preferred technique uh, uh, up to 400 microns is conventional. And beyond uh, 400 microns, uh, the first uh, reflex is to do an inverted ILM flap technique. And when it is more than 800 or 1000 microns uh, of uh, diameter, then we also tend to use the free flap technique. So this is the conventional uh, ILM uh, peeling technique where uh, after staining with the brilliant blue dye, uh, with the use of the uh, pinch and release technique, we initiate the uh, uh, ILM peeling. And once, uh, once we initiate it, we peel it across the macular hole, uh, relieving of all the uh, tangential traction from the retinal surface. And once uh, 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 the ILM is removed from the macular hole surface, uh, another uh, two disc diameter of ILM is usually peeled around the macula. And the uh, end, uh, uh, SF6 is 20% SF6 gas used as a tamponade. We are giving you the phase down position. This is the conventional ILM technique, so which we use. So uh, generally, we this is one of my cases which improve with a good uh, restoration of normal anatomy and the outer retina. Uh, improving from vision of uh, pre of vision of 2080 to 2030. So uh, basically, conventional ILM uh, uh, the, uh, is uh, uh, the generally uh, uh, restores the anatomy of the outer retina, and we generally uh, uh, get a good uh, visual outcomes in uh, about uh, uh, 
um, uh, 96 percent of uh, cases when the uh, macular hole is in the range of 400 to 535 as per this meta-analysis of Renz and Day et al. But however, the closure rates uh, drop down significantly if it goes beyond 800 to uh, microns to 1000 microns. However, uh, we have insufficient data uh, on macular holes which are more than 1000 microns. But average visual gain uh, is around five lines in cases with uh, uh, a hole diameter of 400 to 535 microns. Uh, so, however, the large macular holes are not very uncommon. Based on this classification, we generally have around 50 to 60 percent of as large macular holes, and 5 to 44 percent of the large macular holes have been reported to remain open even after the primary surgery. In the Chen et al. Uh, reviewed around 251 articles and uh, showed that inverted fly -alum flap treatment resulted in better uh, closure rates and visual acuity when compared to the standard ILM peeling for large macular holes. So uh, 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 we all know this Michael Epska et al. Uh, uh, famous uh, uh, depiction of uh, the technique of macular hole where the ILM is uh, uh, peeling is initiated and peeled uh, just to the edge of the macular hole. And uh, around the macular hole, it is uh, not peeled across the uh, macular hole uh, like the conventional technique. And once uh, uh, it is peeled uh, till the edge of the macular hole, another two disc diameters of mac uh, ILM is removed around the macular hole. And at the end, this macular uh, uh, hole is trimmed with uh, a cutter so that the, um, the ILM flap uh, inverts into the macular hole and care is uh, to be taken not to damage the RP in the macular hole. So this is the standard uh, technique as described by the Michaelovska et al. group. And you also know that you get excellent visual outcomes and anatomical outcomes uh, with this technique. And generally in the OCT, we usually see this kind of uh, flaps uh, lying for some time um, post-operatively. Uh, however, the new, uh, the free flap technique uh, described by Maurice and et al. who proposed the creation of free flaps starting from the outer border of the complete ILM field area and then placing over the macular hole to cover it. So this was one case where the MIT was around uh, 1600 microns. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, it was also associated with uh, a traditional ERM, which we removed it. And uh, once we removed it, we harvested one ILM free flap from the nasal part of the retina and placed it over the uh, ILM and to keep it uh, intact uh, uh, over the uh, hole, we used viscous elastic to stabilize it and used uh, uh, gentle air fluid exchange and substituted with uh, uh, gas, uh, SF6 gas. Uh, so uh, uh, post operatively, it, uh, the vision improved to 624 and uh, remained at 624 even after three months. So uh, the, this uh, Renzet et al. Uh, uh, did the um, uh, pool pattern. Doctor, uh, one minute left. Yeah, uh, of uh, these two techniques and told that the higher uh, closure rates and better visual gains have been seen in uh, uh, macular hole. Uh, so with a diameter of 400 to 800 uh, uh, microns. So uh, as uh, we all know, the goal of the surgery is not to uh, really close the hole, but restore the macular anatomy and uh, have a functional outcome. And mere closure of macular hole does not always result in a meaningful uh, visual gain. So this is a case where uh, we had a mere closure, but uh, had only 660 vision. And in this case, uh, we had a good uh, V pattern closure with a good visual outcome of 69, where there is complete restoration of the outer retinal uh, anatomy. So the take home message would be, uh, conventional ILM peeling works well for macular holes of diameter up to uh, 535 microns and the inverted flap and free flap are, uh, uh, are the preferred surgical techniques for large macular holes that may improve the chances of a better anatomical and uh, functional outcome in a single surgery. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Nice talk. Very nice. So questions.
So I have uh, uh, prepared uh, a few questions. Uh, uh, in this. Uh, Yes, Sasha. Uh, I'm sharing the screen. Can I ask a question in the meantime? Yeah. Do you customize your island peeling or do you have one technique for all micro holes or is for the first time for a virgin micro hole or you customize your island peeling according to the configuration unless it's a very extreme sort of micro hole? Sir, uh, usually my go-to technique is only these two. Unless uh, uh, the, uh, either I do come, come. I am saying you have two techniques or you have only one technique. That is what I am asking. No, I less than 400, I just do conventional. If it is more than 400, I do uh, inverted ILM flap for all holes, regardless of uh, whatever association. So, what's the logic for less than 400 conventional and what's uh, greater than 400 ILM? Or it's the other way around that. For the bigger hole, you require an island peeling. That is the logic, or that for conventional will work in only for hand micro. That is the logic. Why not do island invert I inverted island flap in four hundred micro? Also? That is what I'm asking. Yeah, since the data is there, so logically we can do for everything the same technique. But uh, when you can uh, as well. Uh, attain uh, great results with conventional island peeling because the data speaks so. So it is not that uh, we can't do like that. Both the things are uh, vice versa, but we generally follow this norm. Okay. I would uh, like to ask a few questions uh, based on my uh, uh, images so that uh, it becomes easier. Uh, We can't. Can you see, sir? Yeah. No. Yeah. So, uh, what would be the uh, uh, technique of choice if uh, uh, this is the kind of uh, 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 if this is the kind of uh, macular hole we are having, high myope uh, with uh, axial length of thirty two point eight two, and uh, and this is the kind of macular hole you would want to do. Uh, is there, uh, like, we, I, we would definitely do inverted ILM flap, but is there anything we can do it or uh, uh, manage in a high myo along with uh, ILM, inverted ILM flap? I would uh, request any of the panel members to say. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, I will start with that, you know. I don't follow uh, for all myopic macular holes are uh, for inverted flaps, so uh, uh, irrespective of the size. So I, for all the myopic macular hole, irrespective of the size, I will do inverted flap. Yeah. yeah. So, so, sir, uh, do you do conventional axial length for all uh, before? Uh, I mean, is, uh, does AL plays in your uh, any decision making, sir? Axial length, P operative axial length. Does what? Sorry. The operative axial length, but it plays any role in your decision making. Obviously, if if I if I am able to make out the staphyloma and the OCT is good enough to tell me, I don't need to uh, get an axial length in every case actually. Yeah, OCT will give me the real picture. Yeah, uh, uh, Doctor Ahab, uh, you, I, I guess you have a lot of high myopic cases uh, in your uh, uh, practice, so. Well, let me first uh, co uh, comment on the question that you got in the beginning. For real cases, you just remove the ILM, and for beyond 500, you do an ILM flap. I think now, now there is a lot of trials supporting this, but if you're going to peel anyway, there is no need to throw the ILM away, even if it's a 400 mic. I mean, if, if it fails the initial approach, I would rather have the ILM inside the eye as a flap, then I can repose the flap other than I say, I just peel and throw it away and come with the next surgery and trying to find something else or a free flap to close it. So the trauma that happened to re to peel the ILM already is there, whether you put it a flap or whether throw it away. So once I'm peeled the ILM, I'll just do it a flap, whether it's a 400 micron, whatever. Years ago, we were thinking that whatever you put over the macular hole would lead to the whole closure. In the era when we're just using serum, all this stuff, we're just keeping the hole away 
uh, from the uh, from the fluid until the normal anatomy starts to restore or the have the triggering factors for whole closure to carry on. So the question is, should we just follow like it's a roadmap, remove if it's smaller, uh, keep it in if it's larger? No, I think that now if you already initial the trauma of peeling the ILM, I would rather keep it inside the eye. You might need to repost it later just in case if you have failure or whatever. And at the same time, you have a higher success rate. Okay. Uh, bring this back to the question about the, the myopic holes. They are totally different because myopia is a progressive uh, pathology. If you close the hole, it might open up later. And the challenge of the retinal stretching is very important. So in these patients, I always use flaps. And I think Dr. Rela will speak about the multi-layer flap, which, which is one of the techniques, which is my personal favorite technique. And I, I, uh, I always use the technique that he'll be showing into which we use multi-layer flap to make sure that you're covering the, the, uh, the hole all over. And at the same time, by more than one flap to increase your success rate. In, in myopic holes, I try to bring the peel as, as wider as possible because the concept is not just closing the hole, but it's trying to increase retinal elasticity as much as possible. The more you peel, the more the retina is free to start to recoil again. So in myopic macular holes, I use a wide peel and a multi-layer peel. Great insight, sir. So uh, the bottom line is you can use uh, uh, one technique for all the macular holes. So... Yeah, yeah. So uh, if we can move on uh, with the next speaker, uh, Dr. Leela Mohammed. Yeah, so we have our next speaker, Dr. Mohammed Leela, and he's going to be talking on uh, multi-layer flap as technique for large and traumatic holes. On to you, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Ramamurthy. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Um, um, uh, um, full thickness macular hole is defined as the full thickness defect in the neurosensory retina from the RM to the RPE. Uh, classically, the term uh, uh, large macular hole has been uh, reserved to uh, those holes whose diameter exceeded 400 microns as per the classification of DAS and the International uh, Vision Macular Fracture Study Group. More recently, this cutoff diameter has been uh, raised so that uh, uh, a macular hole has to be have a uh, a minimum, minimum linear diameter of at least 500 microns to be considered uh, a large hole. Uh, large holes could be primary or secondary to trauma, myopia, diabetic fractional membranes, the roof, cystal edema, or solar injury, among others. Um, by far, trauma is the uh, 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 most common cause of secondary uh, macular hole, presenting 9% of all holes. And traumatic macular holes usually develop following blunt rather than uh, open globe injury in a ratio of 9 to 1. Um, uh, traumatic macular holes in most cases develop immediately uh, after the trauma, uh, while the accepted theory is the uh, trampoline uh, effect in which there is a su um, sudden uh, short, uh, anteposterior um, shortening the anteposterior axial uh, uh, lines of the globe upon impact with equatorial expansion and flattening of the posterior segment, uh, followed immediately by uh, recoil back to the baseline. Uh, uh, this produces a tangential traction over the macular area with the less mobile tissues causing it to snap at the weakest point, which is the fovea. Another theory is that the different parts of the retina has differential elastic properties, where the uh, fovea being the uh, most elastic, hence uh, most prone to um, uh, deformation upon, uh, and rupture upon extreme uh, stretch. Um, less commonly, traumatic macular holes developed uh, based on other trauma is caused by the adhesions of the ILM with inflow of the fluid vitreous hydration within the retina, cyst formation, and eventually macular hole. Uh, there are certain prognostic factors that herald the uh, final visual uh, function in case of surgery for traumatic macular holes. In general, at baseline, a poor visual acuity, a large ellipsoid zone defect, and a low macular hole height are associated with uh, poor visual acuity six months uh, after surgery. Um, traumatic macular holes are known to have a relatively higher incidence of spontaneous closure uh, compared to the uh, primary variant. Uh, so whenever we are faced with a group of factors as small size uh, of the macular hole, absence of interactive cysts at the edges and young age, we can observe the patient and uh, wait uh, for spontaneous uh, closure, providing we perform serial OCT exams. Uh, spontaneous closure in general is a slow process. It can take up to 12 months. However, uh, waiting that long could risk irreversible damage of the photoreceptors and, uh, again, the question of amblyopia and pediatric patients. So most of the would agree 
um, to proceed to surgery if spontaneous closure was not complete uh, by three months. Uh, in case uh, of macular holes uh, less than 500 microns, this could be managed using the classic approach, vitrectomy, uh, island peel, and gas tamponade, or a, an alternative island flap surgery. Uh, more than 500 microns, uh, the classic surgical approach invariably yields inferior outcomes with a uh, higher incidence of initial failure, late reopening, flat open configuration, incomplete or failed restoration of the uh, ellipsoid zone. For this particular type of holes, we have introduced uh, the technique of a multi-layer uh, RM uh, plug in the year 2020. Uh, the technique uh, consists of uh, creating uh, multiple uh, contiguous breaks in the uh, ILM, 360 around the holes, starting at the point just of the hole, um, uh, usually double the size uh, of the hole. These breaks are then uh, connected together, forming a rosette fashion uh, island flap. Then under perfluorocarbon, uh, this, uh, the, flat, uh, the, the, the island flap is carried uh, centripetally towards the hole until reaching the margin and left tethered at the margin uh, of the hole, and then start stacking the hole in a multi-layer uh, uh, flap pattern over the surface of the hole, uh, taking care not to, to tuck or insinuate the flap inside the hole to avoid damage um, of the RPE layer. Uh, this technique is uh, versatile and could be performed by a number of instruments. These, the brace could be created using the uh, Tano scraper or using the Kines loop, and the centripetal dragon could be could be done using the Tano scraper by the end gripping or the uh, uh, LM uh, feeling forceps. Uh, the mechanism of action of the MEP technique is that uh, in addition to the relief of the anteroposterior traction on the margin of the hole by vitrectomy, uh, the uh, mechanical centripetal dragging of the resultant ILM flap toward the hole reduces the size of the hole intraoperatively. And again, again, during uh, the process of feeding the ILM, the shearing of the full place of the uh, uh, molar cells and the uh, remnants of the ILM attached to the margin of the hole help inside, inside the uh, uh, vial um, proliferation uh, process in order to uh, fill the hole. Um, the multi-layer configuration of the ILM plague, the uh, um, stacking of the ILM in multiple layers or over the surface of the hole helps keeping it in place. Uh, these layers tend to stick to each other and uh, won't be displaced intraoperatively during fluid exchange or uh, uh, later on post-operatively. Post Again, the undersurface of these multi-layers contain uh, remnants of the uh, molar cells that help replenish the hole and uh, form a scaffold for blood proliferation. Um, we had 15 eyes of 15 patients in our study. Uh, we had a mean uh, hole diameter, minimum, minimum mean diameter of 700 microns. Uh, and uh, pre opted best visual acuity 0.06. Uh, the uh, most common uh, category of holes uh, with the primary fall by the traumatic. Um, Postoperatively, we had improvement of five uh, lines of vision and over mean fall up period of four months. Uh, we had 93% U-type closure and 7% V-type uh, closure. Uh, this is an example uh, of a U-type closure of the hole with almost complete restoration of the outer uh, retinal layers. Please note the uh, multiple uh, layers of the RM stacked over the surface of the, uh, the hole. That's another, ex another example of the U-type closure uh, of the hole with uh, almost uh, complete restoration of the outer retinal layers, which is reflected in the improvement of the uh, fixation stability and the uh, macro sensitivity in microperimetry. That's another example of uh, a U-type closure, uh, uh, though with a incomplete restoration or actually failed restoration of the outer retinal layers, and hence the patient had uh, unstable uh, fixation and poor macro sensitivity despite of the whole closure. That's another example of a V-type closure of the hole progressing to a U-type closure uh, by 11 months after surgery. Um, still this partial uh, um, restoration of the outer retinal layers. And so we have like an island of uh, a juxtafogal island of improved sensitivity and fixation. Uh, whereas the rest, uh, the rest of the remaining parts of the macular area have a poor sensitivity. Uh, in comparison to literature, uh, we had a whole diameter, mean a whole diameter of 700 microns, a 93% uh, U-type closure with zero uh, flat open configuration and uh, an improvement of five lines of vision. So uh, accordingly, okay, we can- One minute left. Yes, uh, so accordingly, accordingly, we recommend the MIP technique uh, as an effective 
in promoting uh, microhole closure and improvement in vegetable function uh, in this category of holes. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Very uh, nice depictive uh, photographs. Video. Uh, uh, extremely well presented, sir. And uh, thank you for introducing to this uh, technique. Uh, sir, uh, even uh, Dr. Hebb also was mentioning, once we remove the ILM, the retinal pliability increases so that uh, the um, uh, edges of the macular hole are reapproximate and uh, restore the anatomy and we can have a better visual outcome. So uh, having a multi-layer, does it interfere with this uh, reapproximation of this uh, retinal edges and, uh, and ca causes any problem or is it also a source of future traction or this has been working really well in your study? Or was there any reopening of the uh, whole sort of thing? No, I would think that the multi-layer configuration interferes with the approximation of the edges because actually the, these layers are not insinuated inside the hole. Rather, they cover uh, the surface of the hole and act as a scaffold for the uh, proliferating cells. Uh, can, I ask, can I ask a question? So primarily, uh, this requires uh, the use of PFCL during your surgery, because that's the only way that you can keep the flaps. Yes. We, yes. Do, we do a similar technique, but uh, because we don't use the PFCL, the flaps just move around when we do fluid air exchange. So I think that requires use of PFCL in your surgeries. Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I understand your uh, the other technique. I think it was described by Cassini is the floating island flap technique, where it depends on the uh, incoming uh, flow of air in order to fold the flap to cover the hole. Uh, but yes, our technique uh, definitely requires perfluorocarbon uh, carbon use in order to uh, uh, better locate the flaps over the hole. Sir, uh, sir, I'm lip, sir. Yeah, I have a very, very, you know, I, I always keep wondering what happens to these flaps. I mean, uh, eventually, I have patients; the flaps are there for uh, 13 months, 14 months. So, what eventually happens to the island? Where does it vanish? Uh, actually, on serial OCT exam, uh, especially when you cross the uh, uh, cutoff time of six months and more of that, we don't see them that clearly anymore. Um, I, I don't know what happens with the LM. Probably it got into, uh, integrated uh, in the, in the uh, uh, retinal uh, in the retinal tissue, but I don't know. I don't know what happens. Because I I, I always wonder what happens to even... on OCT after after a while. We can't we don't we don't locate it actually mm -hmm. that clearly as uh, as we do immediately after surgery. Because uh, we don't see it in the vitreous, uh, uh, vitreous cavity. Uh, I mean, is is ILM supposed to disintegrate with time? I don't know. I really don't know. Actually, so I'm not a very uh, fond of this. <laughs> I don't know. Really, don't know. If somebody has the answer, uh, Doctor Murlidhar, Doctor Heman. No, we we do see them in the initial post-op, but later on it doesn't uh, doesn't remain. So I, I'm I'm also multi layer also multi layer also sir. Yeah, I, all this doesn't seem to be there. I mean, okay. I, I've seen initial post-op, they do uh, present, they are present, but later yeah. on, I don't see them. So very tough to say what happens to them in the long run. Yeah. Doctor, Actually, they fuse, they fuse wow. over the retinal surface because we've seen patients more than 36 months or even 24 months, they start to disappear. What happens if you magnify the images and you do a, a serial OCD, you find that they stick to the retinal surface and they're part of the retinal fluid. So when they curl in, the same thing happens at the edge of where you peel. Initially, if you look at the edge where you initially peel, you might see the edge of the ILM itself. Then by time it fuses over the retinal surface. That's right. Uh, uh, Dr. Barbara, I have a question for you. Uh, so. Good morning. Firstly, Hello. Uh, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ma'am, uh, do you have any, uh, like uh, Dr. Herbert described this technique, and uh, uh, do you find in a persistent macular hole, uh, is there any other technique which you resort to, or multi-layer uh, or uh, free flap technique is uh, the one which you go to? Hmm. I don't we don't have the answer on which one is best because we need the surface to cover the hole 
And uh, you've already said uh, how many in how many ways it has been tried. But uh, one point is the anatomical improvement, and very different uh, is the functional improvement. So if we are not able to really close the edges of the hole in the U shape, uh, we will not have a functional improvement. So I'm probably adding one more variable, which is uh, the hydrodissection of the macula. I don't know if some of you already spoke about that. Hydrodissection of the macula and reapposition of the edges of the hole by stretching the edges of the hole and then ex vacuum with the fluid air exchange really closing the hole. I'm doing that in persistent macular hole after the first surgery. I'm adding the macular buckle just because in high myopia, when you manage the macular hole, you might have, uh, you can close the hole, but you could detach the macula. So what I do, my favorite technique is to hydrodissect the macula with the uh, in, um, injection of subretinal BSS, placing a macular buckle and closing the hole over the top, even without uh, without anything inside. I think that's the only way to achieve a, a functional improvement as well. Thank you. Shall we go on to the debates? Yeah, sure, man. Yeah. So uh, we have the first uh, uh, two speakers who are going to be debating. And we have Dr. Sripati Kamath, who is the Associate Professor of the Retina Department at Father Muller Medical College and Netra Jyoti Retina Center from Mangalore. And his topic is temporal flap and gas needed for better functional outcome. And contradicting him is Dr. Jatinder Singh, uh, who is going to be telling that the inverted ILM and air is enough. So shall we start the first set of debates and please stick to your time. Madam, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, okay. My slides are also seen, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, good evening, everybody. At the outset, let me thank uh, I Foundation and uh, the Citra Madam and uh, Ashwarya for giving me this opportunity to talk in this particular forum. Uh, we are going to discuss, uh, basically, this is a kind of presentation which uh, has helped me over a period of time. Basically, I myself have evolved over different types of macular surgeries, and I have uh, basically doing this particular technique now, and it's holding good for me. So this particular topic uh, wherein I will be talking about is the temporal only flap and gas, is it enough for the macular hole closure? As we have understood in the very series of uh, talks, predominantly the principle in the management of the macular hole largely exists in uh, leaving the anterior and the posterior, uh, the anterior posterior traction as well as the tangential traction. And the smaller holes generally do not give much of a problem. But in the conventional uh, uh, pascular vitrectomy, removal of the membrane and the internal limiting membrane, and putting a short tamponade generally was good for most of the smaller holes. Now the problem comes with the medium holes as well as the large sized holes or a recurrent holes. So the medium sized holes, the holes which are about less than about 400 microns, 250 to 400 microns, generally do well with the conventional technique. As against a, a larger holes which are more than 400 microns, then we may have to look into some other techniques like an inverted flap or a, a, adding a short term tamponade with an inverted flap. However, the, the various other techniques, I think this entire talk is on the macular hole. So various, all the people are able to see most of the techniques which have been described. So maybe a macular, as Madam was telling about the macular hole, hydro dissection, usage of a macular buckle, or various other techniques can be generally uh, uh, sorted for based on the individual uh, practices. So predominantly, when you see the problem comes with the larger holes, which have got a poor closure rates. The most commonly resorted technique would be the, the inverted flap technique. But uh, my problem was whenever I sorted out for this particular kind of a technique, uh, the problem was I was not able to get multiple flaps. Sometimes these flaps used to come off. I may not be able to fold these flaps like what is being described generally. So there was a lot of unpredictability with the multiple flaps. And uh, whenever this ILM, which has been stuffed with the uh, multiple uh, kind of, um, uh, the hole which is stuffed with multiple kind of ILM pores, when you look, look these particular holes over a period of time, there was a large area of a kind of an RP atrophy, which was there very much evident in the central part of the macular hole. So that appearance also made us think that should we look for sort, uh, should we actually uh, look for some other technique. 
so in a, an aggressive island peeling itself again cause more of a collateral damage in the initial part then maybe subsequently when we made our techniques more uh, the thing then i think the aggressive peeling was not a problem at all so i was looking for a technique which has got a single flap because uh, wherein a single flap which is placed over the macular hole Uh, generally would uh, uh, would it give a better kind of a picture so therefore i sort of uh, what i study uh, for myself to improvise my technique so i evaluated my patients wherein i used a single flap to evaluate the efficacy and safety of a limited temporal flap for the internal limit of the internal limit membrane for the macular hole closure so my patients predominantly underwent i generally stick to a 23 gauge with them because of my own reasons Uh, wherein I used the 23 gauge vitrectomy and then I stained with the 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 conventional brilliant blue dye and uh, uh, did a temporal flap. Basically, predominantly I lifted off one half of the area and just covered that particular area of the macular hole with the temporal flap and used a 0.3 cc of expansile gas. Uh, uh, of a uh, 14% 0.3 cc gas. I did not dilute the gas for a non-expansile mixture as usual, usually we would do, but I used a, a 14% non-expansile uh, expansile gas into the eye, and uh, after the fluid direction, uh, uh, inferior quadrant couple of patients have had a small breaks when I did a laser barrage around that area, and I stick. Uh, either the problem was about the post-operative face down positioning. so i gave my patients only of 3 hours of post operative uh, positioning face down position and the more importantly this gas which was injected uh, was there was a faster resorption that for most of the patients i could do the oct within one or two weeks of uh, the surgery so this was the technique wherein i predominantly stained the entire island uh, with the brilliant blue and did a limited quadrant temporal peeling and then inverted that entire flap on the fovea I did not do any kind of a papillomacular bundle area flap. I just did a temporal flap and closed the entire area with the the temporal flap. So this is the picture you see here in this particular photograph here. So this was the flap here. It is a superior flap. Then I basically looked into an area wherein either a superior or a temporal flap would do the job. So I had a photograph of the superior flap. So this is the area where I have peeled. So this flap curls out and then it just sticks to the area okay so uh, what i noted is this simple uh, temporal flap of the superior flap whichever it is there is a single flap helps in closure of a, a macular hole here the the sign what we see here predominantly is a kind of a glistening reflex the reflex okay. of the eye i'm touching the the macular hole and this is how the glistening surface would look like this will tell that there is no fluid between the ilm and the opposed retinal surface therefore this would give a better kind of a picture so my results in the patients were significantly better there was a good kind of a macular hole closure uh, i predominantly stick to a uh, short acting temporal because i i use a single flap so the flap adherence is better with a small amount of gas temporal because the better arc of contact and uh, the lesser chances of displacement as against the air when you when you use a, a air then the chances of the flap dislodgement may be there so therefore i use a gas as a mixture then the short acting also gives an advantage of providing a clear and the better view within one or two weeks so you see here this is a very important picture here i at the end of about one week this was a picture where i could see one single flap of an ilm here this over a period of time the it gives a fantastic closure this uh, i initially thought that it is a, a non closure which over a period of time nicely closed over about this is about 4 weeks i see a beautiful closure of a type 1 type of a closure similarly you see here at the end of one week you have only Doctor, a time one over thing which generally closed down similar pictures closing down sir Uh, the concept what i want to bring out is is the delayed closure also a, a thing which is there uh, so with this kind of a single flap gas i feel is a must for, for my technique uh, i also have certain questions for the panel whether the retina does it regenerate does the island have an ability for a contractile component and are we just questioning the conventional theory of tangential attraction Uh, so with this, I want to conclude that minimal uh, temporal peeling with a short gas and uh, short acting gas tamponade is a must, and uh, it is a uh, uh, gas is required for when we do only a minimal peeling, and will be a safe and effective technique achieving early and better closure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. On to you, Dr. Chetinder. 
Nice talk, Doctor. Thank you, Madam. So we'll take the questions of the Prime Minister's. Uh... Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Are the slides visible? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, so I am here to counter what uh, Dr. Shripadi has mentioned. Uh, I will be talking in favor of uh, inverted island flap with air tamponet. Let me set the arena right. We are talking sir, about video screen, factor. Pardon? Make it full, make it full screen, sir. Yeah. It's better. Yeah. So um, setting the arena right, uh, we are talking about idiopathic macular hole which may be small to large, uh, which are treatment knife, not the persistent or the reopened holes. And uh, in both the cases, we have uh, managed to achieve the surgical endpoint. So let's understand what is mechanism of how does ma macular holes close. Uh, we do an island peeling, which induces a titrable trauma to induce a fibrocellular response. The flap, even, uh, in addition with the tamponade, provides a watertight environment at the hole site, at least in the initial period. And as the time passes, it acts like a scaffold for the retinal gliosis. Uh, flap, I, uh, in my opinion, they disin uh, disintegrates over three to six, uh, six months time in most cases. This might be because of a tissue remodeling. And air, because of the surface tension in the initial period, holds the flap in its place. So this is the classic uh, description uh, given by Michaeluska. This is the inverted flap technique. We bring the ILM uh, peeled towards the center, but don't peel it over the edge. And uh, the flap is then inverted over the macular hole. This is just a cover. This is no uh, stuffing or uh, plugging the hole, uh, the flap into the hole. There's plenty of literature uh, since it has been published initially. And um, countering uh, the two um, is the in, in, in uh, inverted flap technique, which I'm uh, proposing is we do a 360 peel instead of doing a 180 degree peel. So we achieve a circumferential release of tangent, tangential traction. No adjuvants are needed to hold the flap. Uh, however, the temporal flap has been uh, proposed as a modification in an attempt to reduce the ILM peeling induced iatrogenic trauma over the nasal side of the macula. The timing of the macula hole has been described that most of the holes close within the first 24 hours. So we really don't need uh, gas. And even if the hole hasn't closed in the first three or four days, the air bubble has resolved. The macular hole continues to heal by retinal uh, gliosis. So this is in a case example, a thousand micron hole, uh, which had an inverted flap uh, done. It was a, a large peel, almost two disc diameters uh, around the hole. And you can see the hole edges getting approximated and closing eventually. There is some amount of retinal gliosis purely because of the size of the hole and not because of the flap. Uh, the vision improved marginally from 660 to 636. So this has been proposed. Um, there are three basic components. Uh, one is providing an interface for glial cell proliferation. The other one is to induce the glial cell stimulation. And third is to provide an uh, uh, tamponade at the site. And uh, if you can increase one component of this by providing an interface, you can still achieve a good success rate, uh, which is uh, the composite of all the three uh, circles in the Venn diagram. And there have been uh, different uh, publications on this uh, subject. Air has been shown to be equally effic efficacious as compared to gas for macular hole closure, even without inverted flap technique. So this is one of the patients who, a patient who had to travel uh, overseas uh, within a week and with the gas, it would have been impossible. And uh, we achieved a good surgical success uh, in, uh, you can see the 10 days post OCT, the hole has closed just with air. So I, in my opinion, the need for gas is unnecessary. Uh, the gas composition related issues are there. There is no fixed percentage, which has been described. There can be a lot of errors in composition. The post-operative IOSP spikes, in, especially in a phacic and pseudophacic eyes can be disturbing. Uh, the accelerated cataract that we see in phacic eyes uh, will result into sub, uh, quick subsequent surgery. The travel restrictions to even to high altitude is uh, difficult. Posturing difficulties and delayed visual rehabilitation. And uh, in rare situations, we, when we need GA, it might be a problem. So these are the few examples. You can see this feathery cataract, which will remain for longer time because of the gas contact with the lens. And sometimes it can cause 
a progression of the cataract uh, rapid progression. This is a patient who developed uh, angle closure glaucoma because of the uh, inadvertent uh, expansion of the gas bubble. So the concerns that are there with the inverted flap are purely baseless, uh, that it requires a lot of skill. Uh, you barely need, I mean, it's not a very skillful uh, surgery. It's not that, that time consuming. The island flap uh, does not interpret the centripetal shift of the uh, hole because we are not stuffing it. The dye toxicity is minimal and it, most of the dyes that we use are pretty safe. So what I propose is doing a minimal island peel, no tucking, no plugging, maintains the retinal sensitivity in the unpeeled area. And in the rare setting, uh, if there is persistent hole or a reopened hole, uh, which I am yet to encounter, the residual island that we have left uh, within the arcade can still be used as a free flap or a pedicle graft. And there are a lot of publications on this, uh, which have shown uh, the good uh, anatomical and functional outcome. So this is the case uh, where you had a hole and uh, the hole edges are approximated. You can see some hyperreflectivity, but uh, autofluorescence is purely... Uh, Doctor, like four minute left. Yeah, I'll just finish. So you don't see much of hydrogenic drama, uh, trauma because of the procedure. The post-island peeling uh, morphostructural morpho alterations that we see are mostly in the temporal macula, uh, where the temporal peel anyway would be resulting into the similar changes. Most of the function, especially the function, uh, is reversible. Uh, the minimal impact on uh, visual function, if at all. The ILM flap contraction has been reported with temporal flap. That's because of the residual ERM over the ILM. The Muller cell proliferation can happen on the undersurface of the ILM. And this is more commonly seen with large flaps and in younger patients. And this will require uh, resurgery because of the worsening of metamorphopsia. So I propose that inverted flap uh, with ILM flap is with air is better than temporal ILM, uh, temporal flap with gas. It gives you early rehabilitation, facilitates, facilitates early assessment of the outcome of the surgery. There is no prohibition uh, for air travel or travel to high altitude. Reduce treatment burden. Avoid uh, elevated Doctor, IP. Time over. Yes. And uh, it avoids the difficulty and errors of constituting non expensive gas. However, I would wait for a prospective, well-designed, randomized controlled trial, which will assess the outcome on a long-term basis with all these tools. And... Uh, all this, uh, the, the, uh, the hypothesis that it uh, gives you less uh, trauma is countered by the greater chances of ILM uh, unfolding and uh, ILM flap contraction. To summarize, uh, air tamponade with non supine positioning is adequate when inverted flap technique is employed. Thank you all. Thank you. On to you, Ashe. An excellent talk. Uh, uh... So basically, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Sripadi told uh, uh, we should not treat uh, ILM as a vestigial uh, organ and peel it indiscriminately. And uh, uh, do you think uh, inverted the flap technique as any uh, uh, prescribed, like uh, the Pecholester told two disc diameters, is it, there is a calculation for it or two disc diameters is standard? Thing for, uh, and for large holes, I do a two disc, uh, disc diameter size uh, uh, around the hole. But uh, for smaller holes, my basic criteria is to peel uh, uh, one and a half hole width uh, of ILM around the ILM, um, around the uh, foveal hole. And uh, the larger the hole, the larger the peel. I mean, they're just directly proportional. So, uh, so my question, uh, Ashway, my question for the panel is like, in my OCT, whichever I showed, there was a small kind of a flap of an ILM, which was there, which is over the macular hole. Now, how do we explain that uh, this flap of the ILM helps in the closure of the macular hole subsequently? Like, how does that happen? If you see, if I share my, yeah. Yeah. it is just like a one small flap, I, which is there. I? Yeah. yeah. Can I answer one, this one? Yeah, yeah. So actually, basically, if you remember the basics of pathology and all, any own closure requires a closed environment. Okay. So as long as the ILM flap, as you rightly shown in your figure, it's a creating a closed environment, it can induce a better glial proliferation. Okay, so that is what is inducing the glial proliferation and bringing the lips closer and which is resulting in a whole closure. So if you observe in your OCT, the one the bottom left, it's a nicely closed. 
See, it just follows the any principle of wound healing. It basically it requires a closed environment. You are right. If the ILM flap is intact, covering the hole, it definitely promotes uh, hole closure. In fact, there is a functional adaptive imaging studies which have been presented in the recent RO, which also suggests the role of calcium transmission. Once you peel the ILM, the vision improves not only because of the hole closure or the approximation of the edges, the calcium transmission also improves. That's what the recent adapt functional adaptive OCT image has shown. Yes. Hope uh, I'm able to answer your question. Yes, yes. Dr. Sripati, you said uh, I need a short acting tamponade. Uh, Dr. Jatinder Singh is already using air. Uh, I, uh, why, why are you not using SF6? Why are you using C3 effect? It is just the availability of the stock because to maintain the two kind of a stock, I'm using the, I use C3 effect for other procedures also. Okay. So it's mean to maintain one single stock. I think uh, the point like what Sir was saying, like the risk for uh, angle closure glaucomas, uh, the need for flight travel and things like that, I think uh, with the 0.3 cc expansile gas, the entire the chamber of uh, the eye which is being filled with the gas is very for a very short duration. So uh, earlier when you used to fill the eye, entire eye, I think uh, Sir may uh, uh, answer this. Uh, the entire when we used to fill the entire eye with the the non-expansile mixture of C3FA, that's when we used to have a larger areas of instances of angle closure glaucoma and uh, inability for the patient to travel, inability to get a good image of the fundus in the initial post-operative period and things like that. But when, when I switched over to a 0.3 cc gas of an expansile mixture, so the entire thing, and uh, it gives a good, in an erect posture, it just gives a good view of uh, the, the fundus as well, and the chances for uh, glaucoma also is much lesser. And with the one single flap, uh, to maintain that flap, I need a little longer duration of contact. Maybe air I felt was a little too short for an absorption when we keep one single flap as against uh, the sir when uh, used to do a 360 degree um, P. Sir, but uh, in uh, vitrectomized eye, uh, even if it quadruples, 0.3 cc will be 1.2 and the arc of contact uh, uh, which uh, only three hours of prone positioning you are giving. So, does really this tamponade is making a difference to the patient, or you can you could have as well used air and uh, spare uh, even that 0.3 cc of usage? No, Ashway, so, this is this is not uh, this is not just one bubble. This is I filled with air in which he is injecting he is injecting uh, C3F8. So now it gets diluted to be about. Uh, 12-13% if I'm not mistaken about 10-12%. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. So, good. With a lot of food for I thought. agree. I agree with Ashray also what you, you're telling. Uh, if I have to add, if it has to close, it will close within a week. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> whether yeah. it's air or gas, if it crosses that duration, then it's a different ball game. So sometimes you have seen when you had an intraoperative OCT during FAE, intraoperatively also the hole starts approximating and this thing. And most of the time, the next day post-op itself will be hole size. It will be almost very small if it has to close. So, but that is not the case that uh, if I just say the hole doesn't close, it will never close. That is not the case. It is very uh, we are about to... I have some questions for you. It's very interesting discussion. Um, I find out that whatever shape and whatever size of flap we are using, I think if the flap goes inside the hole and gets stuck, it prevents the real closure. And at that point, uh, the visual acuity does not increase. So I, I would like to, to know what you try to avoid, uh, what a technique, if you have a technique, what do you try in, in order to avoid that the flap sticks inside and prevents the real closure? Do you have any tip? Because I have tried different sizes, different shapes. I thought if it was larger, it would stay on top. But then, no, it's not true. I have seen large flap going inside. I've seen small flaps going inside. So I don't know. What do you think about this? I but, think for that word, Dr. Sripati has I, this, I, this, yeah. I also, sorry, I, I, 
I would like to tell you that in order to avoid that, what I have been trying to do is before creating a flap, mobilizing the, the edges of the hole very gently with the Tano scraper, but you know, it's a very risky in order to avoid damage on, on top. Anyhow, I'm trying to mobilize and shrink the and get the hole smaller in order to keep the, the ILF flap on top. And I do so before creating the flap. So what did you do? Um, I mean, your hands, maybe that uh, mobilizing the retina might work, but uh, in uh, hands of mortals like us, I think it is uh, going <laughs> to cause more trauma. Um, so. What I basically do is uh, uh, ensure a very uh, complete, uh, completely dry retina with complete fluid air exchange and uh, absolutely yeah. no fluid. And uh, at the end of the procedure, using uh, any soft tip instrument, I use the infusion cannula, the soft tip extrusion cannula with my uh, finger plugging the hole so that there is no passive extrusion and uh, mm -hmm. just uh, uh, roll the, uh, the cannula tip and uh, like uh, reposit the, the flap over the macro hole. I make absolutely no attempt to go towards the edge of the retina or touch the bare retina as much as I can. And uh, it has worked for me for last 12 years and uh, I hope uh, Others can also. So you mean you never had the flap inside? Uh, it okay. just barely gets into the uh, and, and the inner retina, but it never crosses crosses the I would say the uh, the inner eighty percent of the retina. So the most of the edge, well, uh, whole yeah. which uh, repair happens even in natural history, they've shown that the the first thing that comes into contact is the outer nuclear layer and then the ellipsoid zone. Uh, it doesn't reach that uh, deep. In my cases, I have not seen so that. I I have also been it doing a similar technique, and I don't see that it uh, causes a problem in closure. So I think I do the similar, just a similar procedure. I think keeping a slightly larger yeah. flap and keeping it on it, I think is fine. That uh, yeah, I think so. What the, what ma'am is telling the going inside, it happens in, in case of macular hole associated artery, which I'm going to show in my presentation. If there is a subretinal fluid, when you do it then it can go really deep and uh, it it really you know comes in between the ellipsoid zone joining from the other side which well, might this thing now telling the truth even if it does not touch the rpe and uh, the the photoreceptors are continuous uh, and the outer retina is continuous if if the flap goes 80% inside uh, the amount of visual acuity restoration is limited. And I found that because in one case, the patient developed cataract. So with that excuse, I went to cataract surgery and I told her I will do one more maneuver on the macula to try a better closure. I went inside, I tried to displace the flap better. During the fluid air exchange, I removed the flap inadvertently and the hole closed perfectly like it seems never open <laughs> and it made me think a lot that in the first maneuver I made the hole smaller and then removing the cap of ILM I made the hole <laughs> like uh, you've, you've never been there so that anyway. is that is one reason why in small holes I think it's better to remove the ILM rather than having an inverted flap because then you have no possibility of it going down inside. It's true. It's true. Just wanted to take Dr. Hep's uh, uh, opinion. Uh, of uh, We are using so many techniques. Uh, uh, using one technique should do the job or uh, should we customize the different techniques? Dr. Hep. Well, talking. usually when there is more than one technique to solve the same thing, that means that we don't have an ideal yes. solution. That we're, yes. we're all trying. Yes. It. Some techniques yeah. works in some hands, it doesn't work with others, but that doesn't mean yes. it's bad or whatever. Everybody has his own yeah. experience, but having more than one option means that we really don't have one standardized technique that we can all agree upon. Yeah, I totally agree. It's like retinal detachment. If you look at your surgery, all your patients, the worst are always retinal detachment and macular hole. You never know what happens the day after, <laughs> almost. I, I mean, I agree with uh, Barbara and uh, uh, Dr. Elrais. Uh, I, I think the important thing is whatever you do, whether you do a temporal flap, through a multi-layer flap, or through you just do a regular inverse flap, don't stuff it inside. I, I think that's the, really the thing. Otherwise, rest all, all of them seem to work. 
So depending on what's more convenient for you, what is what works best for you, I think you just I, choose the technique. All of them seem to work as uh, Dr. L. Rice I, put, put. Yeah, I think the uh, most in, important thing is keeping the fluid away from the center of hole until it dries up. So theoretically, when we just used to put a gas bubble, a really good gas bubble with good positioning, the hole used to close especially when you increase retinal elasticity by just removing the eye lamp. So closing the hole by any tamponade or whatever we put over the hole brings this chance of hole closure. The bad thing is now the more the things that we'll be using over the holes, it's not just a matter that it might prevent hole closure if it goes inside, but it actually stays like this forever. So we'll have, I think the next debate will be what type to put over the hole. So again, though they help in closing the hole, but we ask ourselves, what are they going to do if they stay over the retinal surface, whether it's amniotic membrane or retinal transplant or whatever. Yes, and on this note, we go on to the second debate. So the procedure of choice for a large refractive macular hole would be dealt by Dr. Darai Shroff, who is the medical director from Shroff uh, Eye Center Delhi. And he's going to say that the amniotic membrane is the best. And we have Dr. Abhishek Anand, who's assistant professor in the Vichur Retina Department in uh, Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Patna. And he's going to say that autologous retinal graft is better. So let's all get on to these two for speakers on this fiery debate. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank Eye Foundation for this opportunity. Can you see the slide? No. Yes. No, sir. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Now? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. So I'd like to thank Dr. Chitra for this opportunity. Yes, sir. I'd like to thank, thank Dr. Ashray for allowing me to fight this debate in the form of a video. So there's no doubt that the amniotic membrane is the best technique, and we're talking about refractory macular holes. But the problem is that there are challenges faced when we try to use this amniotic membrane. What are the difficulties? It's difficult to see. It's translucent, thin difficult to see extraocularly and even intraocularly in high myopes, which are a bugbear for our therapy. The sizing is a problem because it's irregular and arbitrary and leads to non-optimal grafting. And the placement is difficult because it sticks to the forceps, difficult to accurately position. And like we discussed, shoving into the hole causes potential RP damaged. So a friend of mine, Dr. Dilraj and I discussed and we planned to work around, around each of these steps. And this is I mean, a fun movie to show you and share with you. So here it goes. Enjoy the movie. Surgical toolkit for ham grafting in VR surgery. Dr. Rizzo's group recently described the brilliant concept of human amniotic membrane or ham grafting for recurrent macular holes. However, there's hesitancy in adopting this technique due to difficulty in visualizing, handling, and placing the graft. Hi guys, hope you're well. So I am going to hold your hand through preparing, making and roasting the most amazing Christmas roast ham. Let us guide you through our recipe for ham in VR surgery. We depict a surgical toolkit using three S's, staining, sizing and sliding. First S, staining. It is true that the amniotic membrane is indeed difficult to see. It is white, translucent, and thin. Simply staining it with a few drops of brilliant blue dye solves the problem. Second S, sizing. We need to determine the graft size and then cut it neatly and accurately. We use inexpensive disposable dermal trephines. We measure the macular hole indices preoperatively on OCT B scan. After some trial and error, we found that the optimal graph size is roughly the average of the sum of the minimum linear diameter and the base diameter. See how easy it is to get the perfectly sized graft with a dermal trephine. Third is sliding. Accurately and atraumatically placing the ham graft is a major challenge. We use a bimanual sliding technique with a tano brush and a nitinol flexible loop. Let's see a few cases. The 62 year old lady presented with failed macular hole surgery done two months ago. See how nicely the graph slides in with the bimanual technique 
using a tano brush and a finesse loop. Post-operatively, the hole is closed. This RD case came post-operatively with an attached retina, but had developed a macular hole and oil emulsification. We did a silicon oil removal and bi-manually placed a ham graft into the macular hole. See how beautifully the hole has closed. This was a failed macular hole case who developed a total retinal detachment with vitreous hemorrhage. In such cases, we place the graft under PFO or after fluid air exchange. You can see how we bi-manually slide and spread the graft and place it accurately under PFO. Post-operative OCT shows that a retina is attached and the macular hole is closed. This was a very high myope with a posterior pole retinal detachment and a macular hole. In this case, we slid in the ham after fluid air exchange. In such cases, we take the graft size to be twice the MLD. See how scary the pre-op OCT was and how nicely the retina is settled with a ham graft. Look at this. I mean, luscious. There is no more festive sight than a glazed ham. With the triple S technique, we provide you with a toolkit and our recipe for the perfect ham graft in VR surgery. That was nice, Dr. Dais. Thank you. Excellent uh, video, sir. On to our next, uh, Dr. Abhishek. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. On the outside, I would like to thank TMI Foundation, Chitra Ma'am, and my special friend, Dr. Ashfe and Jatinder sir, for giving me an opportunity to spread, uh, express my thought process on uh, closing a large refractive macro hole through Oculus retinal graft. And as you can hear from our my senior, Dr. Daya sir, that he's solving a problem. You know, it's still a problem and he's trying to. So there are multiple options available for solving a large refractive macro hole. And the current, and what, one thing we must know that each one of these techniques has an adequate justification for its use and data supporting individual results are scarce and lack of a large randomized clinical trials prevent definitive conclusions to be drawn regarding anatomical and functional outcomes in the long term. Overall, if you compare regarding the closing and the amount of visual equity gain, they almost compare each uh, size two. Today, we are going to compare two techniques. One is the amniotic membrane versus an autologous retinal graft. So we all know that these both are uh, have something to fold with a scaffold technique, and the, as a scaffold, they provide uh, a, a scaffold for proliferation, calling of glial cells like Muller cells, bringing the whole edge closure or adding a type two closure. However, autologous neurosensory retinal free fab should not be seen just as a mere scaffold, and I would like to come that you should be seeing it as a super scaffold. Regarding just comparison as a scaffold per se. The, the problem that Dr. Dras has just enumerated, it is easy to handle and unroll. Uh, I mean, the neurosensory graft is easy to handle and unroll than other scaffolds. It is more sturdy than other alternatives. No need to tuck inside the hole, avoiding RP damage, and it is autologous and easily available. Now, what makes NSG a super scaffold? It is integrated, it is vascularized, it is functional, and it is anatomical. Now, what is about this? This is by his own friend, Dr. Dilaj Grewal, and seen, and this is a that I have taken a picture. What you see is the first, the top picture, and you see that the 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 autograph is white, uh, totally white and, and hyperreflective. But what you see after two months of follow up is that the complete restoration of the outer retinal layers. And this is what is the characteristic of MSG that if you achieve a closure, the almost 60% of these will have a good outer retinal layer, which is not, which will not be available with any other scaffold if used in a refractive macular hole. This is another picture taken from this you see, uh, And what you see is that the neurosensory graft has integrated and the white arrows indicate the formation of the outer retinal layers, the ELM and the my ellipsoid and the myojoin. This is from another case study. And what you see is the serial pictures from the two months and the six months. In the top picture, what you see is that there is a defect at the neurosensory graft junction and the host tissue recipient. And at one year follow up, uh, one year follow up, there this graft, this is a, a remodeling of this whole thing. And you can see an exact good ELM, ellipsoid, or myojoin. And then in the white arrow itself indicates that there is some formalization at the graft tissue. 
this is a, this is a surgery i would like to uh, so, so this is a patient who was roaming around he is a one eyed patient and under oil he has a chronic retinal detachment for 2 years and this patient had a inferior retinal detachment with a chronic atrophic retina and multiple holes in this we prepared plant for a 180 degree retinectomy and there was a slit like retinal defect uh, just adjacent to the superior laser retina and we fashioned a new sensory graft and we put it under the pfcl and we put it there now why and uh, and this uh, and then we did a direct pfcl silicon silicon oil exchange and then we uh, and then we put the silicon oil and we, uh, and and close uh, the case but why i want to show you the case is that they uh, unfortunately this patient again underwent came with a detachment and we had to operate reoperate him for a shallow detachment and we operated him under oil and what we see under the oil is that this zero sensitive graft has perfectly integrated with this this uh, recipient bed it is uh, there is a shallow fluid which is present and still the graft is not dislocated or anything so it shows that there is some amount of synaptic connections and integration of the graft around the host bed itself and this is very important this is another case of eight series in which you see that situation follow up there is a integration of the graft host junction and there is a remodeling that is constantly happening and this remodeling can happen up till two, two years there is another uh, regarding the vascularization well uh, many many studies are there and most of them have shown that the periphery of the graft host junction gets vascularized but the center does it remains a vascularization there is a vascular integration which is also taking place the same thing is another case is confirmed on the fundus fluorescent angiography now regarding the functional gain we see there are three case uh, in this group, in the top picture on the a side we see that there is the overall if you see the multifocal erd uh, there is some depression but there is some function functionality present in the case one which was evaluated at one month uh, one month and then at seven month and at 2.5 years follow up at one month there was complete or absence of the erd but it gradually regains its function at Uh, at the seven follow up there the periphoveal and the central foveal is still depressed but at 2.5 years only the fovea is depressed and the periphoveal region has regained its function so regarding everything that is there is a concern regarding the graft dislocation retinal detachment there is a question doctor one okay. minute left yeah in the functional gain and the surgical learning curve especially for graft procurement graft sizing and translocating to a recipient bed but in order to counter it i would just say are you asking the right question and it's a work in progress and future appears to be bright for nsd now everything is not bright and rosy for amniotic membrane itself you see this uh, uh this uh, bright tissue which is sitting in between and this can remain for up to 2 years which has been uh, and between the and it can uh, prevent the integration of the photoreceptor layers this is another uh, case series in which the amniotic in the first top picture the amniotic membrane has leaked rolled and it caused it uh, It, it failed to roll and it causes a detachment of uh, due to the upward uh, due to the lift at the uh, macular head edge. In the second phase, there is a contraction of the amniotic membrane, leading to uh, leading to changes in the. Uh, and in the third picture, you can see there is a uh, incomplete opening and closure of the bed, and lead that leads to atrophy at the place. So, if we have to change, so right now we are with the. Put the time over. the question whether we want to take this one which is on the right side the peripheral retina and on the inferior side of the amniotic membrane i also i would say go for the super scaffold and you make a wise decision thank you brilliant talk nice on to you ashe let's uh, the discussion brief we have four more uh, uh, master class talks uh, yeah as you rightly pointed out in a retinal detachment we would want to plug that hole with uh, either of these two elements but uh, in real life do you accept type 2 closure or you want to see that uh, retinal ledges bridging the question is to whom what the no ideally you want the best right you want the type 1 closure right but then uh, i feel that uh, there are two techniques of uh, in in if you go for nsd and if it Uh, it gets integrated and you, you get a complete restoration of the normal anatomy almost complete apart from the foveal dip that you are seeing that will not be present regarding the amniotic membrane there are two techniques one is when you put the uh, put the amniotic membrane in the in this which was shown by sir and another is you put it like a cap 
over it and that will uh, but even in those cases almost 100% of cases didn't have the type 1 closure it has a type 2 closure no sir uh, i think the main thing is that uh, amniotic membrane this is something we are using for very very refractory recalcitrant cases i think that's the main uh, main kind of take home it's not that we're going to do this in any routine cases very very high myopic eyes i think it works well other thing is i find uh, of course uh, jokes aside uh, uh, the uh, neurosensory graft also works very well but i feel cases which have a detached retina sometimes i feel less uh, worried about cutting a large piece of retina and stuffing it in attached retina i still shy from cutting the retina and getting a choroidal bleed in those cases i find the amniotic so i made my own algorithm large recalcitrant holes which have failed many many surgeries if retina is attached i and uh, i don't expect very good vision if it's high myope i do amniotic membrane but if it's detached and i would agree, agree with abhishek i would go for a neurosensory graft final word from my doctor elrias and dr barbara ma'am can, can i ask one question from daray sir regarding his technique yes, yes. so uh, hi sir a wonderful video conversations on that and sir regarding you are actually uh, regarding the uh, amniotic membrane graft size you were yeah. trying to almost match it uh, i mean you wanted to keep it the minimum but there are studies which have kept it a very large to a very small so yeah so in your case was that due to the small size was that the necessity to stuff it a bit inside because in all your cases i could see the amniotic membrane because yeah, it's a very small size of the so it depends on whether you do underlay technique or overlay technique i did overlay and had my hands burnt because it kind of flew off so now i do underlay if you want underlay you have to kind of balance the size if it's too large and you do underlay it kind of crinkles and then it becomes like those horrific cases you showed at the end of your debate that why it failed so this is the uh, this is the kind of formula which i showed in the video which gives you the optimal size it's large enough to kind of cause apposition but it's not so large that it crinkles inside and folds and causes to close in this odd sort of manner or it doesn't pop out also either so that's why i kind of made this formula <laughs> thank you very much we uh, on to the master class after uh, two very good uh, very interesting debates and we have dr ahlam uh, who's going to be talking on supracoroidal macular buckle in myopic uh, macular holes so look forward to your very interesting talk doctor I'd like to uh, thank you first for the kind invitation and it's a pleasure to be with you and I can see a lot of my friends uh, in this session so uh, I'm very happy to be so. The other thing is I'm very happy also to be sharing something common between me and uh, Parolini which are the buckling technique or the macular buckling technique. So um, let's go back first. So my talk today is about supracroidal macular buckling for uh, myopic or vitromacular interface disorders. What have we learned over the last 13 years working with this technique? First of all, let's say that we can close most holes just by doing vitrectomy, ILM, peeling, and flaps, even with these patch techniques that we spoke about. But what about failed cases or cases with extreme myopia beyond 32 millimeters axial lens? The retina is under stress and sometimes it fails to yield back in the sclera, especially while we know that myopia is an ongoing axial elongation procedure, especially when you have a staphyloma. So what about this uh, progressive elongation? And that is the role of posterior support of the macular area. And the longer the sclera extends posteriorly, the more the tractional forces happen over the retinal surface, whether tangentially or anteroposteriorly. By supporting the sclera from the back, you actually decrease these tractional forces over the macular area. And this happens by macular buckles. This article is from the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, and I'm happy to see that article because it reviews most of the techniques that are used or types of buckles that we use to try to counteract that or use macular buckles. I won't speak into it because I know my dear friend, uh, Dr. Parlini, will speak about it uh, in a couple of minutes. So when we look about the support of the sclera that happens, we know that either we can go by supporting the, the sclera and the choroid, which is the classic macular buckle,
buckles, whether we use the under implants or other the implants. And this new implant by Ackman, which I'll tell you that I personally uh, uh, like this buckle over the rest of the buckles because it has a flat surface rather than a convexity. And you can achieve a similar buckle like this. And you can see this buckle here when we go one step, which is the suprachoroidal buckle technique. And you can see the exactly the same indentation that happens in the macular area compared if we put a scleral macular buckle. The difference is here we use the sclera and the choroid to indent, but here we're using just the choroid to indent uh, the uh, uh, choroid and support the retina. So how does this happen? The idea behind it is to bring the choroid back to the retina by using a filler instead of using the sclera. Theoretically, you don't need the sclera to achieve chorioretinal adhesion or to support the retina. You need the choroid to support the retina. So how does this happen? You theoretically bring the staphylomatous space instead of between the choroid and the retina to between the choroid and the sclera or bypassing the problem of axial elongation that happens. For that, we developed 13 years ago this catheter that has light and it could be connected to a filler. If you take it a section in this catheter, this is how it looks like. It has a halo lumen inside and a light fiber to illuminate and shine. It is atraumatic at the tip because it has like an olive uh, blunt uh, tire shape here. Then you connect it to a filler that you can inject and separate the choroid or support the retina. What do we use as fillers to be injected in that space? We use perlane, which is a cross-linked hyaluronic acid. It's normal as the helon that we use inside the eye. And once you inject it, it stays as one bubble and it can last in the subcutaneous tissue as fillers for up to 14 months. And is this enough? The answer is yes. If you can separate the choroid from the sclera or support it for at least eight months, it never goes back. And that was one of the questions that we were asking ourselves, how we're going to keep that space separated for time. So it's nothing but more of a hyaluronic acid cross-linked as we use inside the eye. So the technique again involves that placing a suprachoroidal catheter in the suprachoroidal space after making a scleral incision four millimeter behind the limbus and in the back part of the eye we inject the filler separating the choroid to close the, the macular hole or uh, the uh, vitromacular interface if it's a case of schesis. Then we developed another catheter that is non-illuminated. By time, we found that we don't need an illuminated catheter. We can use this drug delimited catheter that we developed with Med1 to inject the filler in a similar technique without the need of the light. So we make a scleral cut four millimeter behind the limbus, expose the choroid, then gradually open the last lamella by the ithermy. Then we inject this colostic to separate the choroid from the sclera, and the catheter is threaded to the back part of the eye till you reach the target tissue or right underneath the macula if it's a macular hole or underneath, of course, the, uh, the macular area if it's just for your macular uh, uh, schesis and you can support the back part of the eye. You glide the catheter by pushing on the sclera and you can see the catheter moving in the suprachoroidal space all the way to the back part of the eye. Once we are underneath the target tissue, you start to inject and you can see the choroid lifting as creating a scleral macular buckle, but it is theoretically a suprachoroidal macular buckle and you can see flattening on table of the macular hole. So this is while using the uh, non-illuminated catheter. Now, and you can see this, this choroidal separation that happens. The choroid is separated from the sclera and supporting the macular hole, and you have an excavation here. This is not what ideally I want to see, and I'll tell you why in a moment. I don't need that height, which is created also by scleral macular buckles. The height is, is, a, is a bad thing, not a good thing. You need just to reconfirm the back part of the eye. So this is over-injection, and I'll tell you in a minute how this happens. Another patient like this chronic macular hole that we moved the ILM several times, myopic, failed uh, to close. Again, in the suprachoroidal space, you start to inject, you can easily, and in this slide, you can see the expansion of the choroid what happens. The choroid starts to elevate. We just need a good choroidal support, not too high to support the area of the uh, macular hole. If you take an OCT of that similar patient, that's what you get. You get the elevation inside the eye, like it looks like a scleral buckle. And at the back, you see the excavation that happened and the choroid goes up supporting the retina and the sclera at the back here with the resonance and a big cavity created supporting the macular area according to make it how high you want it or how wide you want it. You can control it by just moving the catheter in the suprachoroidal space to achieve the height and the width that you need. 
Now, in real life cases, this is a patient that had failed macular hole surgery twice, a myopic patient in a staphyloma, and you can see the fluid is trapped in the area of staphyloma, and the edge is elliptical because we removed the ILM several times before, failed, and the fluid stays trapped inside. So in this patient, we got the catheter inside the eye again, all the way you can guide it according where the location is. And right underneath where the hole is, you start to inject. This is an eccentric hole at the same time, which is more challenging to put a scleral uh, macular buckle. And once you inject, you can see the choroid now indenting the, and you can see it clearly, the choroid is supporting the hole right now, and the fluid is pushed posteriorly outside the staphyloma. And this is the area that was uh, buckled uh, for that patient. This is how it looks like pre-op, and that's uh, on table what you get by creating uh, the uh, suprachoroidal macular buckling. One month post, you can see the indentation is right there, and this is how it looks like with the choroidal separation and the cavity that's created, the choroidal thickness, and the hole closed over uh, this that is taken at one month. In four years, that same patient, again, you can see the indentation, and we ask ourselves, what is filling this space? What happened? Because if we are looking at hyaluronic acid, we expect it to go away by 12 to 14 months. But we found that if you separate or severe the choroid from the sclera or remove the septa that connects the choroid to the sclera in an area of staphyloma, the choroid tends to stick to retina. It never goes back again. And that's why after four years, you still have that choroidal indentation. And we've been following up for more than 10 years. These holes uh, never open because you bypass the pathology. And even if scleral uh, elongation happens, it happens happens behind the area that was already uh, buckled before. Now, another patient, you can see the pre picture with the retina opened and post and again the hole is closed and the separation that happens right here that's taken pre and post and for that serial patient one month 12 month and six years post op still you have the excavation and the retina is well supported and the hole is closed the height is different of course but still the separation over six years these holes are closed and the support is still there several patients this patient was done under vitrectomy ilm peeling a flap and under silicone and still we got silicone trapped through the macular hole, we remove the silicone and we just put the buckle in that area. And you can see that the retina is flat again with no tamponade just by using uh, the, the macular buckle and a, a, an, an air bubble for uh, two days after. Now, I showed you this patient here again. Uh, doing a buckle just to show you the technique. Theoretically, this patient, you can just do a vitrectomy and close it. So I'm just showing you for the, for the sake of the technique itself how it goes. So um, this here. And if you see this patient, you can even remove the ILM later on once the buckle is created here. The macular hole is before injecting. Once you inject, you can see that expansion wave. You can control the height. You don't want it too high. This patient, I'm showing you the bad things that happens. If you inject too much, you're actually indenting the macular hole and it might open. And at the end, we remove the ILM in this patient. It's easier, of course, when it's supported. There you can see you, sometimes you can manipulate the edges by pulling centrally instead of centripetally to uh, close such a hole. So this is the dome, how it looks like. I don't want it to look like this. What have we learned by time? If theoretically, you just need to restore the normal convexity of the back part of the eye. If you do too much indentation, you might uh, affect the circulation inside the choroid. And this is what sometimes happens even with scleral macular buckles, and it's always a point of debate. The initial data was published years ago in 2014 for the her first uh, series. We always ask two questions. What about the choroidal perfusion? Because it's a debatable point. I spoke several times with Carlos Mateo about the perfusion that happens and the alteration that happens, the retin pigment epithelium, when we put scleral macular buckles. So let's look here. This patient, the trial we did in Japan, is looking into the choroidal perfusion with ICG after doing macular buckles. For a 21 day after, you do get a little bit of macular affection here for the choroidal perfusion. Is this the same with uh, macular scleral macular buckles the answer is yes but is this dangerous no because the perfusion if it is a concern the amount of indentation is very important if you put a too high buckle then you're pressing on the perfusion whether you're using a metal uh, scleral buckle or a suprachoroidal buckle also so this is a point to know in mind you're trying to restore the normal convexity not too much in then the second point is the choroidal thickness a very thin choroid definitely will have some affection of the perfusion 
Uh, the higher blood supply is something in our favor because there's lots of posterior ciliary vessels that uh, feed the macular area. So that helps us in making it more comfortable by putting a buckle back there because we know we have high perfusion in the macular area. The resorption cushion effect is something re reversible because this is not a metallic metal compression over the circulation, but it is a cushion of viscoelastic, which is in favor of this technique. And let's look at this patient here after creating a, a macular buckle. What is the normal progression of myopic changes like in this patient. He, this is the area that was buckled. Taken at six months, you can see that there, of course, there are also some myopic macro degeneration outside the back of the buckled area. At 12 months, you can see that also there is progression outside. This is a site that patient had a CNV. Look at the progression of the myopia changes even outside the buckled area. So to see myopic coriolatal adhesion while you do macular buckling, it is present, not just to the sake of perfusion, but these are normal changes that happen over years. If you look at this patient three years compared to that one month, though there's some changes, but it's outside the area that was buckled. It can happen inside and outside as well. So that is what point that we always argue upon when I see uh, Carlos about the broider perfusion. There is definitely a learning curve. Uh, to put a catheter inside the eye, you should think about hemorrhage. So there are tricks how to avoid hemorrhages. Some of what we call track hemorrhage while pushing the catheter um, through the supracorrent space, you might have some hemorrhages around and there are ways uh, to get around that, I'll speak about it in a minute. What have we learned by time? We're using a supracoroidal macular catheter. You can achieve any type of buckling for different forms of staphyloma because you can guide the catheter even in type 5 staphylomas where the staphylomas is eccentric. You can always reach that by the catheter. So this is one thing that you don't always have to stick to uh, scleral macular buckles if you, to place it in one side, but you can achieve buckling over several areas by guiding the catheter to whatever uh, area you want. How to avoid hemorrhage? It goes step by step. I like to use first between 11 and 1 o'clock if I'm using superiorly or start at 5 to 7 if I'm using an inferior location to entry. When you open the last lamella, always open by diathermy, which avoids cutting the choroid and at the same time avoid damaging the choroid. You need an intact choroid to do this technique. While pushing the catheter inside, always push against the sclera. Don't push against the choroid. So you push against the sclera and let the sclera glide the catheter to the back part of the eye to the target tissue. And at the same time, the catheter at the tip is an olive tip, so it's actually dissecting. It's not cutting its way through. Use sometimes when you have resistance, inject a little bit of viscoelastic on your way, which actually separates the choroid from the sclera and makes it gliding easier. Create a dome and never expand the dome to make it high. You need to restore or bypass the staphyloma. Don't over indent. Whether you're putting a, a scleral macular buckling or using a suprachoroidal macular buckling. Doctor, uh, we learn one minute left. I'm sorry? How to control hemorrhage, as I, I told you about it, and at the same time, keep the, the pressure uh, uh, high. Sometimes when you have a little bit of hemorrhage, you can increase the intraocular pressure. And this technique is done just by a chandelier. You don't need to do it while doing a vitrectomy. So most of these patients, you could do it in a 20, 30 minute procedure by just putting a chandelier and sliding the catheter to the back part of the eye. It's not for extreme choroidal thickening patients. If you have a patient less than 80 microns, then I would go for a scleral macular bucket, not a super because you don't have choroid to indent. So this is one of the mires that we find by time. In super thin choroid, you always go for scleral, not um, uh, uh, super choroidal buckets. Elevating the choroid, usually to the level of the optic nerve, which is the zero point, is very important to restore the normal convexity. You don't need to over indent, as I mentioned. Learning curve is very important. And at the same time, this solves the problem of axial elongation, which is a continuous process in high myopic eyes. We have to always think about myopic detachments. It's an ongoing process and you will have later on elongation of the eye so posterior indentation whether it's clearer or superhoidal is the way to go these results encourage us to use it even in in failed patients in which the initial procedure did, didn't work or sometimes in very high uh, uh, myopic holes with staphylomas i always use this technique thank you so much for your attention thank you very much doctor that was an amazingly skilled surgery on to you ashley Sir, uh, extremely mesmerizing talk and, uh, uh, you know, the talk uh, or your uh, surgeries were more beautiful. I couldn't decide. But anyways, uh, I just want to ask, uh, is there uh, uh, axial length, uh, 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 certain axial length which guides you to this uh, technique or uh, is there uh, any prerequisites for uh, doing this uh, technique or is it a primary textbook? 
See, when you see the patient preoperatively and you see that there is a deep staphyloma inside, I know with the evolving techniques, a lot of surgeons can solve a lot of things by putting, for example, multi-layer flaps or whatever. But when there is a deep staphyloma, then I think about using this technique in supporting the retina. As Dr. Parlini just mentioned, you can use this technique in a, or macular buckles in association with, uh, with retinal hydration to, to increase the retinal elasticity. So now when this technique is a little bit, at least in my hands, takes like 20, 30 minutes. I always use a support, even if I'm using it uh, in association with something else. And I think just by supporting the retina to close the hole on table, you get dryness of the fluid, whatever it is, even in a staphyloma. So as I showed you, the, one of the patients here that was resistant for vitrectomy before ILM peeled and still you have an electric irregular hole on table when you inject just to close the edges of the hole, it dries up by quite some time. And this is done, as I just mentioned, underneath uh, just a chandelier light or whatever. So before I was using it not as an initial procedure, but using failed myopic macular holes, like those that you use, uh, whether use the eye lamp flaps or whatever, if it failed, then I'll go ahead with that. But now in certain indications, like more than 34 millimeters, you know that the risk of failure is higher, then I always put a suprachoroidal macular support. Sir, Thank you. Sir just a last question. Uh, I know we have a lot of time. But uh, you, you you completely peeled off the ILM. Uh, do you think? Uh, no, 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 no. ILM that was one of the patients I was showing just for the sake of the technique. But I never remove an ILM in these patients. If it's just a myopic macular hole or a higher axial lens, you just support the retina from the back, like putting a regular uh, scleral uh, macular buckle. It closes. You don't need to do, to uh, remove the ILM. So you can do it in association with another technique or just uh, uh, closing the whole posterior. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. So we go on to the uh, truly lucky to have the esteemed presence of Dr. Barbara, and she's going to take this discussion further by talking on macular buckle and myopic traction, maculopathy. On to you, Doctor. Thank you. You're showing my talk, Ashrai? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, well, we can, can open her presentation. Yes, Just enable audio also. Thank you for uh, being connected with us, Dr. Barbara. We are truly obliged. Madam is on vacation. Thank yeah, you. Very nice. Of you. I think you must have equally enjoyed these talks. So it's playing? Uh, no, it's not playing. Not it. Sir? No, no. No, Velo. It is not playing. Oh, Do you want me to share my talk? I don't want to waste any time. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, you can. I you hope stop, it's... stop sharing, Red Morgan. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Ma'am, it's not full screen, ma'am. Ma'am, it's. Could you press the play button? Like that, okay? Can you see it in Mom, full it's screen? Not, it's not full screen. Full screen. Make it full screen. <clears throat> you have? Come on. I was not prepared for this. I thought uh, you were. Velu, <laughs> uh, can you share that uh, video? Sure. Sir. Oh, that's really bad. You cannot see like that. You can Please. see, but it, would it play without play button being pressed? You just see it. That's all. Can you? <clears throat> and you, you don't you don't see the the slides? 
we see the slides ma'am but it's not full screen uh, that's the only problem but uh, yeah i will do it sir yeah, yeah. yeah. dr babra can you just wait a minute we'll try from my yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. You don't hear though. Don't hear you. Ah. Oh. Can we want the volume, Neil Morgan? I have published a few years ago that this is the new myopic attraction of the stadium system. And this is the table summarizing all there is to know in 1990. Oh, that's bad. I'm so sorry. Uh, would you, uh, if available, stop sharing? Can we take the next talk and uh, whether we could hear? Madam? We don't hear hear it at all. It's not here. One second. Well, we're going to, it's going to take. Sorry, my one second. I was so much looking forward to show it to you. I'm so sorry. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, would you just uh, like to talk on uh, I think we are uh, back to the video. No, there's no way. So, Shall we, uh, uh, no, no. Ben Burgan, can you stop sharing now? Yes, ma'am. You have to stop sharing. It's not, we can't hear the volume. Uh, can you try to coordinate with Dr. Barbara and, uh, so that she yeah. can, from her end, Ashe, can you do that? Yeah, sure, ma'am. Sure. In the interim, we go on to our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bia Sharnan, who's the chief of retina and vitreous services from the Arvind IKS system, Squimbator. And he's going to talk on another challenging talk, relaxing retinectomy in macular hole surgery. Uh, Sharnan, I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't give you time to. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I'll just uh, share my screen. Ashay, can you ensure yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just doing that. Uh, my slides visible now, sorry. Yes, yes. Okay, so I was uh, I had skipped the uh, pathology part because I thought uh, Bagulani Madam will be talking about it anyway. But anyway, so uh, these were the terms initially used for uh, myopic traction maculopathy, but now, now the commonly accepted term is myopic ma traction maculopathy. And I'm just showing some uh, few photographs of early and late here. This is the one patient who's got a just the, you can see the thicker and contracted. Uh, uh, posterior uh, sciatic vitreous causing the right eye you don't see any tractional effect but in the left eye you can see the inner layer is lifted up showing the early tractional effect and here in the next patient you can see that the inner layers are slightly getting uh, pulled up causing uh, early schisis in the left eye more prominent in the left eye and also in the right eye uh, in the nasal quadrant so again this is one more case showing the uh, inner retinal schisis much more prominently and you can have a secondary CNM in this particular patient 
and this is the last stage of the disease where you can get either inner lamellar holes or a full thickness macular hole with a post hole detachment. So I'll be talking about uh, two cases of uh, myopic uh, uh, macular holes which did not close with the primary surgery and how we uh, went about managing them. So because of the uh, high degree of uh, myo uh, the staphyloma and the high degree of myopia, the staphyloma is uh, outgrowth of the scleral uh, layers. And uh, apart from that, you have the uh, thickening and stiffening of the uh, sciatic vitreous internal ending membrane. And also, the, even the blood vessels cause some amount of traction. The, all, all these leads to a sort of a stiffer retina, which fails to uh, bow posteriorly to conform to the curvature of the new curvature of the sclera. So what happens is when you have a secondary macular hole, this can be a problem with the uh, successful macular hole closure. And the various options have been vitrectomy uh, su supported with macular buckles and also uh, uh, plain macular buckles. All the, these have been proposed as a treatment uh, for uh, uh, myopic macular holes. And as you can see from this one of the studies that the, there's almost 30% risk of failure compared to uh, almost 2% with the routine patients. In high myopic patients, the chance of hole closure with the, is, is quite uh, uh, poor. We have almost 30 to 40 percent risk of uh, failure in one of these studies, which showed here. So the normal globe here, I'm just showing a sort of a schematic uh, representation, and we have a posterior bowing of the sclera because of staphyloma, and the retina does not fall, uh, fall backward because of the various uh, forces which we described. You have both the anterior posterior tractional force from the vitreous. And the tangential uh, tractional force from the sciatic uh, posterior vitreous and the ILM and the uh, blood vessels and other uh, because of the RP migration because of the retinal uh, proliferation. So the ideal choice would be to support uh, uh, the uh, posterior sclera uh, the, with the my myopic uh, and macular buckle or like uh, the previous speaker we showed uh, where we can push the choroid inside by through using a suprachoroidal buckle. So either of these things would be the ideal choice. But uh, as, as already shown earlier, there are not very people who practice this because of various uh, learning, you know, steep learning curve and also the availability of uh, cheaper alternatives. Like in India, we don't have a very good... Uh, uh, cheaper buckles, the, the easier and more successful buckles are quite expensive. So what I was trying to see uh, use in uh, two of my cases was I was trying to make a peripheral uh, rather temporal retinectomy, a uh, wide retinectomy to allow the retina to slip. Like normally you see in a giant retinal tear, when we can have a posterior retinal slippage. So similarly, in our cases, I was trying to create an intentional retinal slippage by creating an intentional temporal a GRT or a retinectomy, a large retina, relaxing retinectomy to allow the retina to fall back and conform to the curvature of the sclera and choroid. That's what the, this technique was. I just showed two cases here. This is a one night 54 year lady who was blind in the other eye and she had already undergone uh, a scleral buckling surgery approximately 20 years back. And she came with a drop in uh, vision because of a post pole uh, hole and a post pole detachment. And the initial surgery, uh, it was not successful. And again, this is the preoperative uh, OCT. And uh, you can see the large uh, staphyloma with the uh, elevated retina. So after the initial surgery, we could not achieve total uh, opposition of the retina to the RP and choroid, uh, this and the sclera. So it was the... Uh, what? Yeah. What? Uh, loudly or... Yeah, yeah. So uh, the hole was not uh, closed and the retina was not opposed uh, with, uh, to the uh, 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 sclera and choroid. So we had to uh, go in for a second procedure because we could not achieve a primary success. The vision was still poor and it was a one-night patient. So uh, what I did here was, you can see in the video as you can see here. Uh, so after removing this silicone oil, I did a uh, tried to do ILM peel to do an inverse flap, but the ILM was very thin and I was not able to do a successful complete flap. It was coming in small, small bits and pieces. So I was not able to achieve a, a good flap to cover the... Because initially also they had done ILM peel. It was not... Uh, it was only I was trying to work from the peripheral bits. I was not able to get a full flap because the retina was quite thin. The ILM also was coming in extreme uh, pieces. Uh, and you can see the atrophy just temporal to the fovea, a large area of uh, exposed sclera because of the atrophy. So I did a relaxing retinectomy extending from the inferior, almost temporal to 12 hour, 12 clock hours as in inferior, I mean, temporal and inferior relaxing retinectomy. And using a vertical scissors, I'm just fashioning a small scleral, uh, I'm sorry, small retinal flap from the peripheral edge of the peripheral relaxed retina. This is all done under PFCL. And I'm trying to uh, uh, here create a flap with the vertical scissors here. And once the flap is fashioned, using my forceps, 
I am dragging the retina under the PFCL uh, to sort of lead it on to the uh, posterior pole to cover the uh, open uh, macular hole. So here I am doing a, both the relaxing retinectomy. And because I had a relaxing retinectomy, I did a small piece of, uh, uh, designed a small piece of autograph from the peripheral uh, edge of the RR and then uh, pulled it over to this to support the uh, large macular hole. It's quite a large macular hole. I, had, I did it to support the macular hole. So uh, after around uh, four months, we did a silicone oil removal also. And uh, this I can see that now the surgery is complete. And I put a, did a laser and then put in silicone oil also. And uh, this is the post SOR picture and vision improved to 6, uh, 18. And you can see the uh, uh, opposition of the retina now. And you can see the graft is closing the macular hole. You cannot see the macular hole. And uh, you can see this is the area of the, uh, the laser mark. This is a 18 degree area where the retinectomy was done in temporal uh, almost six, uh, six clock hours from our approximately 12 to 6. So a large retinectomy to allow the retina to relax and slip into the posterior staphyloma. So this is the second case. Uh, again, uh, one, I mean, this patient already had uh, undergone primary surgery, but it was not successful. And post SOR, she went in for a recurrent attachment. Initially, it was successful, but post uh, silicon oil removal, you can see the residual silicon oil bubble there. And after that, she went in for a recurrent retinal detachment. Again, the same technique, peeled off the PVR and then uh, doing a, uh, trying to do ILM flap. In this case, I was able to successfully fashion and sub support the macular hole with a sort of an inverted multi-layered flap there. And then I'm doing uh, this temporal retinectomy, as you can see here. And it is uh, relaxing the whole uh, temporal uh, retina, starting with the inferior part. So to create a large uh, uh, sort of a GRT sort of effect to allow the retina to slip. So this is what I was trying to do. And we were able to attach the retina and close the hole also. So I just, after this, I found out a small study uh, of around 11 cases. This is not a RD cases, but this is a myopic uh, staphyloma with myopic holes. So they, here they did a, a sort of a temporal relaxing retinectomy, but not as peripheral like I did. Uh, but they did it just outside the area of the staphyloma, but those are all in attached retina and they were able to achieve uh, decent success in their uh, uh, cases. You can see the relaxing retinectomy is done just at the outside edge of the peripheral, uh, peripheral to the edge of the posterior staphyloma. Because these were attached retina, they didn't go uh, peripheral like in my cases. I did because it was uh, already detached retina. Just wanted to show these two cases as a sort of a technique for uh, attaching uh, 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 macular holes uh, with the large staphylomas to allow uh, intentional slippage by creating a giant retinal stair. I'll stop here and I'll take questions. Amazingly terrific uh, concept, uh, Sharman. Mm -hmm. I don't know about others. I was stunned. Um, is Dr. Barbara's video there? Uh, Actually, I will try again to share my talk. I'm sorry the video I sent you is not working. I will try again. And uh, if it's not full screen, you will just follow my voice, okay? Okay. You have the live speaker. Okay, I will try and share again from the video. See, I see it in full screen mode. I don't know why you don't. I'm so sorry. Would you just present in this manner? Yeah, yeah. Side by side. Yeah. So. <clears throat> We cannot speak about MTM as uh, one single um, disease. Uh, I have uh, published the new myopic traction maculopathy staging system. It's not new. It was into, published in 2020. In this uh, single table, you have everything you need to know on MTM, which uh, progresses from stage one inner schizis to stage two outer schizis to stage three schizis and detachment to stage four only detachment but uh, full detachment without schizis. For each of the single stages, you can have an intact fovea, inner fovea in stage A, or a lamellar macular hole in stage B, or a full thickness macular hole in stage C. The and it's very slides are not slides, advancing. Slides are not advancing. Slides are not advancing. Do you see the table? No, no, no. We are not seeing. We are just seeing the first slide. Oh come on! This is there's something against oh, no, me no, today. No, no. I, I, no, it's you, fine. So maybe you have to keep uh, moving from slide to slide. Slide to slide. Yeah, on on your left side. Yeah, yeah. 
you have to keep moving don't don't, don't go to show just keep the do way and don't go to show you will uh, <laughs> stick to yeah. now you see yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, i'm so sorry okay let's continue with this anyhow this was the publication and this is the table just to show you the evolution from stage 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to stage a b and c so in this single table you have all the stages of MTM. And uh, I have um, published also the uh, validation of the um, um, staging system at an international level very interest, uh, very recently with uh, a very wide uh, group of ophthalmologists not familiar with that, just to show you that it is very easy to validate uh, um, and to use the staging system. So basically, in summary, you look at the retina, inside the retina, and select one, two, three, or four, and then you look at the inner fovea and select A, B, or C. And uh, I will skip to um, treatment because uh, I would like not to waste uh, any more time. So many colleagues uh, really give up on these myopic eyes, but I think with this... Uh, um, technique, uh, we might have uh, a solution. Because the literature reports that if you use only vitrectomy, the success rate uh, is a 60% uh, as far as functional uh, success and 80% uh, when it is anatomical success. But it also says that for more severe stages, you can have a complete failure. So I'm telling you, this is not true if you follow the correct uh, technique. So for most of the colleagues, uh, this type of attachment uh, is considered a success. I don't think it is a success because the macula is atrophic. You have a full thickness macular hole and you might have glaucoma secondary to siliconoid. So just because the retina is attached, it doesn't mean the eye can see. These are some of my publication, but the one that I want to highlight is the proposal of man management based on the stage. So this is the same um, <clears throat> slide, uh, but uh, upgraded with the uh, guidelines of management per uh, stage. In summary, the whole need an ILM flap while schizes and detachment need a buckle. So what I propose you to do is to use a buckle since the beginning as a first treatment if you have a schizes and detachment. So the ILM flap is very important only if you need to close the hole, but if you have a detachment without a hole, you need a buckle. I started to present my buckles in 2009. At that time, actually, Carlos Mateo had not even published the first article on that. And we were speaking about buckles at uh, the HITAN meeting in Amsterdam. And since then, I evolved the model of the buckle, as you see. I started in 2007, this model, and then I switched to a thinner model in 2011. In 2020, I started the AJL to use the AJL buckle. And then recently I modified the AJL buckle, which is commercially available in this model you see in the bottom right picture. So this is the, the shape of the new buckle. It has a large arm with four holes, which make uh, the surgical technique of insertion much easier. I will show you the technique uh, in a minute from, from a video. I care to tell you that I am studying a nomogram to tell you at which distance to place the needle of the suture from the limbus based on the axial length. So basically, I'm studying the correlation between axial length and suture distance from the limbus. For example, in this patient in uh, stage uh, 3C, the axial length is 30.80 five so you can uh, insert uh, you can place the suture at 10.5 millimeter from the limbus you insert the buckle and uh, just the suture uh, even the anterior um, you place the suture in the anterior holes and the buckle is uh, inside so it makes the techniques uh, extremely much much easier actually uh, it's like uh, implanting a glaucoma valve, basically. You just uh, suture the uh, 
um, the buckle uh, in that specific spot uh, with the non-reabsorbable suture and uh, and it's over. And um, I have seen that uh, instead of using a panoramic viewing system, if we use a flat lens uh, to look at the posterior pole, it's easier because at the same time we can see the buckle and uh, the macula. So I will show you in a minute, I am placing uh, a, a flat lens on top of the macula and uh, with high myopia uh, and the trans illumination, you can see the macula through the flat lens um, much, um, it's, it's actually easy. You can use the trans illumination, but I can tell you that I tried even without trans illumination. I also have the interoperative OCT. It's very useful, but it's not uh, mandatory to have it. So basically this is the new technique. You just measure, you insert the buckle and you check it through the flat lens uh, with or without uh, the, the light. And uh, it's actually much easier than it used to be. So my personal case series since 2007 is 400 macular buckles. I'm collecting the data and I have available data on 265 over the 15 years follow-up. The anatomical success, believe me, it is true. When the buckle is placed correctly, you always attach the macula. So the variable is not the anatomical success, but it's the functional success, which is different based on the rate of atrophy that you have preoperatively and, of course, the status of the anterior media. There are complications. I think... They are very acceptable compared to complication of uh, multiple vitrectomies, and but the success rate is very high. Let me show you some example. This patient with the buckle to attach the retina combined to ILM to close the hole. This is the type of success you gain, 4 over 10. Another example, pre-op to post-op. You see, even with the buckle, we don't want, and I agree with the EHAB, we don't want to push the retina too much. We just almost want a flat, um, a, a flat result. Like in this case, as you see on the bottom, 7 over 10 visual acuity after four years with a great improvement in uh, vision and uh, microperimetry. So... This is what you can end up after multiple vitrectomies and uh, silicon oil uh, usage. This patient comes to me for the second eye with this type of OCT. I only place a buckle and this is the end uh, result uh, with a great improvement in vision. Same thing for this patient, vitrectomy only in one eye. She comes for the other eye just buckle, and this is the result, 7 over 10, normal IOP. This patient came with a bilateral problem. I did the buckle in the right eye, and uh, here you can see the result. He went to another hospital for economical reason uh, to have a, a vitrectomy in the other eye. And on the bottom, you see the result. So from detached retina without hole, he passed to fully detached retina with the hole. So he came back. I placed a, a buckle and, uh, and uh, this is the, the result. So one word on development of atrophy. It's been reported that buckles develop atrophy. So I, this is, as you see in this picture, you see the development of atrophy, but this is not after buckle. This is the natural history of high myopia, which has been published by Kyoko Ono Matsui. Because in these patients, the atrophy develops anyway. And so I am studying the development of atrophy over a long period of time, and I don't see an increased atrophy more, uh, more than in the fellow art in the eye operated uh, with the buckle, as you see from this picture. So the last picture that I want to share is my best patient with the detached macula. I placed the buckle to reach a flat macula, and then I 
operated him uh, with uh, FACO and implanted a multifocal IOL, he can see 2020 unaided far and near. But this is to say that this patient, if you operate them correctly, they can gain a lot of vision. So um, I, I'm, I, I'm done with the talk just to tell you in summary that the anatomical success is extremely high. Uh, it helps avoiding silicon oil and the results are long lasting and uh, they, that the, the development of atrophy is comparable to the natural history of the disease. Okay. Oh, that was a stunning presentation, Dr. Barbara. Thank you. I'm sorry for wasting your time with this technical problem. I care to say that uh, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Elrias on the, the fact that we need to buckle the, the macula of these patients, but you can choose the way of doing so. I just find, because I've done, for the 15 years I've done macular buckles, so I think they are easier. But as he was saying, I think any one of us can be more familiar with one technique more than the other. We can compare the rate of complications the type of buckle that I'm showing is customized so you can change the shape. You can make it thinner and longer. You just ask the company to change. And um, uh, I find it easy to implant because it basically the, the, the complications are very, very acceptable. And uh, you can use it for any thickness of choroid and any axial length. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, doctor. So we shall go on to our last speaker, uh, Dr. Puna Chandra, who's a, a virtual retina consultant from Narayan Nitralia, Bangalore, and he's going to be talking on managing macular hold with retinal detachment. So it's getting more and more complex. So on to you, Dr. Puna Chandra. So uh, good evening, ma'am. Hope uh, you can see my presentation in full screen mode and uh, am I audible? Not full screen, yeah, yeah, full screen. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ashray and Chitra ma'am and I Foundation team for giving me this opportunity. So I'll be talking on mac managing macular hole with retinal detachment. So, so we all know the definition of full thickness macular hole. I won't go into the details of it. So macular holes are rarely reported as an additional feature in macular of regmatogenous retinal detachment along with a peripheral causative break. The coexisting macular hole is seen approximately in 1 to 4 percent case of this regmatogenous detachment. If you look at the publications in 90s, it is less because maybe the OCT was not that extensively used. Now we are using more and more OCT. Maybe you are able to pick up more and more macular holes in uh, uh, regmatogenous detachments. So it is almost exclusively on macular holes in eye myopia, about which we have had an extensive discussion. We won't, I won't go into the details of it. And we also know the cause for macular hole associated RD myopic eyes, tangential traction, hardening of the internal limiting membranes, stiffened arterioles, vertical traction by the retina that cannot stretch after staphylomatis elongation. All these things have been extensively discussed. So these are the basic investigations what we do. Uh, when we uh, decide to operate an any RD case. Uh, but uh, since uh, if there is an associated macular hole, we should, uh, as discussed earlier, uh, we need to pay more attention to the fundus autofluorescence. Octa, if there is an associated CNVM, it's difficult to pick up in these cases in myopic, but we can definitely try doing it. So there are multiple options which are available for surgical management of macular hole RD. We can do only pneumatic retinopexy. We can do macular buckling. As uh, just now we had a talk from Dr. Barbalina, madam. So we can do a pass plana vitrectomy with scleral buckle and a long standing gas tamponade vitrectomy with PPV with ILM peeling with or without oil. So let me uh, show a case example. So this was a 33-year-old male who came with complaints of sudden decrease in vision in the right eye, and the vision was county finger close to face. He had a RD which looked like a regmatogenous retinal detachment with an inferior pigmentary changes, but you are not able to locate any of the break. So we did B-scan and other things to rule out the exudative because, of course, it didn't look like an exudative RD. 
So, but nothing was suggestive of an uh, exudative RDM. We presume this has to be an uh, regmatogenous component, but you are not able to locate the hole. Intraoperatively, when I did the core vitrectomy and ran the SRF, this is what I found. This is an intraoperative picture. There is a macular hole with a pear-shaped extension on either side. I'm not sure whether we can call it as a macular break. Okay, so in this case, we decided to proceed with the belt buckle vitrectomy with ILM peeling and the other allied procedures. So this is the video I uh, started with doing 360 degree belt buckle. So this using belt buckle in this particular case is arguable. The reason why I decided to put 360 degree 240 band is we are first of all, we were not, I was not sure of the break position. Uh, where it was, it could be a pass planar break also. And also this being a fake patient, I thought it's better to give an adequate uh, vitreous base support. That's the reason I decided to put a 360 degree uh, 240 band. So after that, I'll just go to the vitrectomy part of it. So once I did the, uh, the 360 uh, band, uh, the 240 number band and 360 degree. I cleared the core vitreous. As you can see, once I clear all the core vitreous and the peripheral vitreous, the macular break was visible. So I stained using brilliant blue uh, under the uh, saline. So after that, what I did was I peeled the ILM all over. I peeled it 360 degree around this macular break and I uh, tried inverting the same ILM onto the hole so this is the situation which i was telling earlier where the ilm sometimes can go more than 80 percent deep so like that but uh, this is the kind of hole which i had never seen and first time i was operating i was not sure i thought better to be on the safer side i peeled it from all over and i just inverted onto it so after that i used a silicon oil tamponade because uh, i created a separate drainage retinotomy so this is the post-operative picture where you can see the retina is nicely attached with a good buccal indent and the macular hole also appeared closed. So this is the post-operative OCT picture after five days, two weeks and one month. Though the macular hole, which looked like a break, was very large, it was nicely closed. But if you look at the outer retina, ellipsoid zone was not still joining. Maybe that internal limiting membrane is interfering with the regrowth or joining of the ellipsoid zone but the patient had a good visual recovery of 6 by 24 parts the second case here is a 54 year old male who came with complaints of decrease in vision if you see he had a macular hole which can be seen here along with a primary break superiorly but if you look at the configuration of the retinal detachment, it was not uh, very typical of a regmatogenous. If you look at, there is a demarcation line and there is a peripheral attached retina. So I feel along with the primary break, this macular hole is also contributing to this configuration of retinal detachment. So this is the OCT of the same patient, which confirmed it was a full thickness macular hole. So in the surgery, I did the same technique which I showed in the last case. I peeled it all over in the 360 degree. I, I inverted the uh, ILM flaps over, to, over the macular region. I didn't try to stuff it very deep because uh, I don't wanted this uh, ILM flap to go subretinal. I just placed it over. When I did the uh, fluid air exchange, luckily it didn't displace. And post-operatively, the retina was attached and this is the primary break which has been lasered and the macular hole was also closed. So this is the post-operative OCT picture where you can see a closed macular hole, vision improved to 6 by 18. Again, as we was discussing, so if you see the outer retina, there is some amount of hyperreflectivity which is seen just above the rpe i'm not sure i'm just still following up this case whether this will disappear or eventually the ilm will join i am not sure about that this could be a scarring or this could be the ilm which is folded because we have inverted in a detached retina so sometimes it can be difficult to peel the ilm in a detached retina because peeling under the pfcl can be challenging if the ilm fragments are if it's abnormally aberrant when i was going through this thing i came across this uh, small marble technique by dr chira who practices in us in these techniques we introduce a very small bubble of pfcl which is approximately one to two disc diameter not a large pfcl bubble and we peel around this PFCL bubble and invert it. 
So while injecting the PFCL bubble, we should make sure that we inject it over the disc and also we'll remove from the disc in order to uh, prevent subretinal migration. So the inverted flag technique definitely reduces the frequency of postoperative flat open appearance of the macular. I'm, I'm talking all this in the context of regmatogenous RD, not the myopic RD. That's a different thing. And there'll definitely be improved anatomical outcome of vitrectomy for large macular hole. And also it is hypothesized that, as I was telling, the inverted ILM flap technique induces proliferation of glial cells that eventually fill the macular hole. And also it kind of creates a closed environment for the macular hole wound to heal and oppose to each other. But contrary to the expectation, this technique may not always improve postoperative visual acuity beyond certain extent. The reason could be the potential damage to the retinal pigment epithelium, which is usually less in a case of detached retina as compared to an inverted flap, which we do an attached retina for a macular hole, isolated macular hole. So it could be a surgical trauma, cytotoxicity of the dyes, and also the ILM tissue, which gets introduced and which reaches up to the RP, it may again interfere with the, the regeneration of the outer retina. The prognostic factor we know like we have discussed extensively on the status, duration, extent, all these things matters. So if you go to the literature, the vitrectomy alone, the success rate will be 33%. If we add an ILM peeling, the success rate goes up to 91%. With inverted flap, it is up to 96 to 100%. Doctor, and one minute left. Combined, yes, I'm almost done. Vitrectomy combined with scleral buckling, it is 87% for the settling of the retinal detachment but 31% for the macular hole closure. Whereas PPV with an inverted flap, which I used in my series, I operated, I use the same technique for almost more than 10 cases now. The reattachment is 98 to 100% in my cases. Luckily, so far it's 100%. So although to date we know that there is no general consensus on, on controversy remains the most appropriate surgical treatment, but uh, vitrectomy with various additional types of internal limiting membrane peeling techniques like inverted have generally been considered preferred surgical approach in uh, recent years. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'll thank be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Purna, for uh, keeping it uh, very interesting in spite of being the last speaker. So Ashley. <laughs> Uh, uh, sir, uh, the like uh, Dr. Sarvanan, uh, I'll just ask one question to you and then uh, Purna. Sir, is there any location you would uh, choose to take the graft, sir? So because I'm doing a large uh, relaxing retinectomy from uh, uh, whole 180 degree, you can take it from anywhere you want. I usually would do the at the edge of um, usually inferior is more convenient to me, that's why. Okay, sir. But uh, as you go periphery, that uh, yes. now be thinner. So uh, does it make any difference, or it is just? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. So, uh, uh, Purna, uh, like uh, silicon oil, the uh, um, uh, the macular pigments do dissolve. Do you have? Uh, so the visual outcome will definitely be lesser in uh, because of the pathology also. But is there any alternative to bypass this? I, have you tried enter gas? No, I have tried under the gas. I have showed the case where you have put the silicon. Here I have put the silicon oil not for the macular hole purpose. That is for the RD purpose, but different purpose because travel and all that. This is not for a long-term tamponade of the macular hole. I have tried with the gas with the same results, similar results. Okay, so as I told the first case, it was I was unsure of the thing and patient had to travel back and all that. I don't want to put it under the air for sure. So considering those reasons, uh, I had to put a silicon oil in these two cases, which I showed. Uh, but uh, in other cases, I don't use silicon oil in all cases. I just use C3F8, not SF6, C3F8. I want a little longer tamponade. Yeah. So I think we had a long day. Uh, mesmerizing talks from our international faculty. So, we, if we can all agree, we can call it a day. Uh, I think Thank you so much. A very, very special thanks to the star studded expert panel and the kind of vibrant discussions which came up. If an anterior segment surgeon could enjoy all three of us of it, I know you each of you would have really learned or gained a lot more from the discussions which came through. I really want to thank uh, each and every one of you, dear expert panel and speakers, for making it such an amazing three-hour event. 
thanks a lot uh, ashray for uh, literally planning every uh, tiny bit of this uh, meeting and i think this is what you had uh, imagined or visualized uh, a couple of months back and i'm sure you must be feeling very happy about it all i think finally we all have to thank all our attendees who have watched and the good news is they even if many do not watch today they do watch over a period of time do tell all your friends to watch this amazing uh, retina uh, retina webinar which we've had today thank you very much thank you one and all of you thank you thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you thank you thank you very much thank you all good night thank you all good night, good night. Good night. Thank you, sir, and, uh, Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Ahab, Alria, and uh, Dr. Barbara. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being there. Right till the end.